and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to IGF Bali 2013. I hope you can enjoy the convenience of Bali surrounding in your busy schedules here. We will now resume the meeting. I declare this afternoon session open. Please allow me to open this focus session which is dealing with legal and other framework for spam, hacking, and cybercrime. I'm looking forward to our discussion, discussion about these important issues that I believe this session is heart of the dialogue for this IGF. In this session, we have some distinguished speakers and one moderator. Our speaker is Jayanta Fernando, Director and Legal Advisor from ICT Agency of Sri Lanka. Okay. Chris Painter, Coordinator for Cyber Issue from U.S. Department of State. And Karen Mulberry, Policy Advisor from Internet Society. Wodenetris, Mr. Wodenetris, Consultant Expert, International Cybercrime, Security and Spam Cooperation. I would like to introduce also our moderator, Mr. Chris Boyer from AT&T, and Karen Mulberry from Internet Society. I don't have much words to, uh, to give the introduction, but I just remind you about the, some explanation from our website. Some of specific issues we will discuss, so please start having ideas so we can hear from your comments and questions, including negative economic and social impact of spam and other malware, successful education and capacity building initiative, effective approaches to public-private partnership and other forms of cooperation, model legal framework for addressing hacking and cybercrime, legal and technical effort to address cross-border criminal activity on the Internet. I just want to share about my country experience because I have some lesson learned in practice once we get involved in drafting and also implementing Indonesian law number 11 to years 2008 regarding Electronic Information and Transaction Act. We call this as single omnibus law for Indonesian cyber law. Some cyber crime cases had been handled such as cyber terror, cyber stalking, data interference, system interference, misuse of device, cyber fraud and forgery and so on. The horizontal conflict also in the pluralism community due to any illegal or unlawful content that, that against the public moral and public norms, such as online defamation, racist, religious blasphemy, and so on, should not be construed as a simple thing also and underestimated. In principles, we had already known that cybercrime is the ultimum remedium, but the most important thing is to, to prevent the crime itself. It would be reduced by the effort to socialize the cyber ethics, it should be, that might be forgotten to be pronounced and implemented in the society. I personally would like to have enrichment from this discussion should we make a clear distinction between spamming and hacking outside from the scope of cybercrime issues, or it might be included in the scope of cybercrime. I believe this topic has been at the center at our dialogue at the IGF. I hope we will have a lively discussion. We have an expert panel, I had already pronounced, and uh, before uh, delivering to the moderators, I would like to give Mr. Kumar uh, at least five minutes to say some important things. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will not be take five minutes. I'm Marcus Kumar. I also work for the Internet Society, and I chair the preparatory process. And in the preparatory process, we took note of the recommendations that came out of the working group on IGF improvements. That was a working group under the Commission of Science and Technology for Development. And one recommendation was that each IGF session should address two or three policy questions. We thought it would be a good idea to ask the community for input, and we collected them, and they are available on the IGF website. Now, the policy questions for this session, legal and other frameworks, are up on the screen, and I know the moderator will go through them uh, through in, during the session. We received nine questions, which is actually quite a lot, and shows there's a lot of interest for this session, and. Some of them relate what role can the IGF play in this important aspect of Internet governance. And with that, over to you, Mr. Moderator. Chris, please. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to, to this session. Um, as has been discussed previously, uh, the session today is going to focus on uh, legal frameworks for um, spam, hacking, and um, cybercrime. Um, so uh, from an organizational perspective, um, what I will do as the moderator is um, ask each of the panelists um, a few questions on each of the three topics. Uh, we will cover them um, one by one. So we'll start with spam and then uh, um, spend around uh, 30 to 45 minutes on each uh, topic area um, and ask the panelists for their general perspectives there. And then once we are um, through each of the three topics, we will turn to the um, uh, questions that were provided that Mr. Coomer mentioned. Um, and um, go through there. And I would like to encourage the audience, uh, this is intended to be an interactive discussion, so encourage the audience to ask questions um, af after the panelists speak to the different topics. Um, if you have questions, please um, um, speak up and uh, come to the microphones and we, we would take uh, input um, from the audience. So with that, um, we'll get started. Um, so the first question here is, um, really just um, regarding is to start with the topic of spam. And I think the initial question would be just I'd like to get the panelists to offer a general perspective on um, how big of a problem is spam, um, you know, and how successful have we been in uh, managing that problem over the past um, several years. So maybe uh, start, um, I guess, with uh, Karen. Is it, you want to go first? Certainly, thank you very much. I'm Karen Mulberry. I'm with the Internet Society. And in terms of the problem of spam, um, my first exposure to, to the differences related to spam occurred during the Wicket Treaty Conference and, and the big debate about including spam in an international treaty. Uh, and then that built upon, um, with, with all of the delegations and, and the countries that were participating, what was the meaning of spam, and, and what were the issues related to spam? Um, in particular, it was an issue for developing countries that they needed to, to you know, in, in their view, everything that was, was um, a problem with the, their internet could be attributed to spam in some fashion, um, which led us to believe that, that maybe there needed to be a better approach to help them understand what truly what was spam and, and how that might help them better improve their internet and manage their network. Um, so as a result of that, um, the Internet Society has developed a, a project to conduct outreach to developing countries to help them um, build their capacity and better understand what it means uh, to combat spam um, what tools that are out there for them to use and what experts that, that uh, are out there that will assist them in, in better understanding their choices and the options that they may uh, want to implement within their countries. So it, you say it's, it's all about building capacity and, and creating that multi-stakeholder approach to sharing that information and providing some enablers. Um, it's kind of an overview right now of, of what's going on. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, Chris, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I think when we talk about spam, I echo what Karen said, is that we have to define what we mean. And, uh, for, and spam has a couple of major effects on networks. But first, I think uh, we need to be clear that when we're talking about spam, we're talking about unsolicited commercial email, uh, not uh, email that, that involves uh, uh, political speech or other kind of speech. I think one of the concerns that, that we've seen as people try to uh, address spam, much in the same way we've seen concerns when people try to address the issue of cybersecurity, is that it's not used as a proxy to uh, infringe on various political speech or human rights. So we have to keep these things very distinct as we look at them, uh, both in uh, with respect to spam in particular, but more generally with respect to security issues and threats to the network. And spam 
to me has two aspects. One, uh, just the effects that that has in the network in terms of bandwidth of the network and, and clogging the pipes, if you will. Uh, but also a, as a vehicle, and this is where it bleeds over to some other areas of the panel, as a vehicle uh, for malicious code, for spear phishing ta attacks, for other issues that we've seen more and more, and I'll talk about when we get to the other parts of the panel. So there clearly is, I think, a real concern there, and there clearly is uh, a need for this to be addressed uh, by countries around the world, and countries are in different levels of addressing this. And I'll talk a little bit about what we've done in the U.S., but also talk a little bit about the international efforts that I think others here uh, will, will address even more. I, you know, and, and I think the, the, the Wicket was a good example. Uh, I think we all recognize this is something that should be addressed. There are places where it can be addressed. Uh, and I think one of the values of, the, of this discussion at the IGF is that the IGF can act somewhat of, as a router, if you will, in pointing to some of the places where this is being discussed and some of the actions that are being done. Um, so. Uh, there have been a lot of multi-stakeholder efforts, you'll hear about some of them today, to address this issue both by the technical community, there have been legal efforts around the world as people have tried to come up with the right kind of regimes to deal with this. In the U.S., uh, we have, uh, in 2003, we passed a law to combat spam, and again, commercially unsolicited email, called the Controlling the Assault of uh, Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act, uh, Can Spam. I did not come up with that uh, That. Uh, um, that acronym, but nevertheless, uh, the act required that unsolicited commercial email messages be labeled, though not through a standard method, also included an opt-out provision, um, uh, and ha had a, a number of provisions dealing with deceptive practices. Um, the, you know, there were sort of mixed reactions to that act. It's been on the books for a while. It's been enforced for, for a while, but the key thing about it, I think, is that, uh, and, it, and it certainly isn't a complete fix because it's a legal regime, but at the same time, you do need the technical community to, and, uh, and industry to, to address this issue as a technical issue as well. Um, the FTC, our Federal Trade Commission, has been the, the, um, the main enforcement mechanism uh, for this, uh, and um, they have taken action both through preventative measures by helping educate consumers uh, through and, and through enforcement measures by bringing cases against companies with uh, pretty successful results, and I think that's been important. Uh, and often they work closely in a multi-stakeholder way with industry in those efforts, uh, highlighting the value of having a public-private partnership here. Uh, but how are we working collaboratively to address this issue globally, because it clearly is a global issue as well? And what I'd say is there are a number of programs uh, that the range of stakeholders are engaged in, uh, and the range of stakeholders are represented at IGF, uh, through the Internet Society, as was just discussed, and some of those outreach efforts, which I think are critical, given this is an issue for the developing world, uh, and through the uh, messaging malware and mobile anti-abuse uh, working group, or otherwise known as MOG, uh, and other groups that are very valuable and which we will have and uh, which we will hear from uh, more about today. And I think some of those uh, organic efforts that involve multiple stakeholders, including governments, but also, uh, most importantly, industry and consumers and others, I think really are something that uh, perhaps are not that well known about uh, around the globe, and particularly the developing world doesn't know all these efforts are under the way. So one of the things I think it's incumbent on us to do and incumbent on the IGF to do is to make sure there's awareness of those efforts and, and that, that there are things that are being done, there are places for countries and other stakeholders to plug into. Um, uh, you know, these, these efforts go a long way to uh, addressing both the nuisance and the malicious nature of spam, which are the key components uh, of cyber hygiene or, or due diligence measures that also improve cybersecurity uh, more generally. Uh, and we, we'd be very interested to hear from all of you today uh, that are here as part of this discussion uh, about remaining concerns, about other ongoing efforts that are out there, and other ideas for new efforts. But I think part of what we need to do is raise awareness and make sure that countries understand what, where, where this is being debated, how they can plug in, and not necessarily uh, decide to go to different forms that may not have the expertise or ability to really deal with this. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chris. Um, Jayanta? So, so uh, thank you, Chris. I will make a very, very brief intervention here. Uh, when we talk of spam, uh, especially in a 
small developing country like Sri Lanka, we often ask ourselves the question, is it a mere technical issue or is it a legal issue or a combination of both? Uh, our general consensus, uh, particularly from my jurisdiction, is that this is a subject where the technical communities as well as the legal policy communities have to work together to address the issue. And SPAM is one area where the multi-stakeholder model can play a pivotal role. And I think Chris pointed out the various uh, working groups and other fora working uh, on this subject. In Sri Lanka, we have taken uh, certain steps requiring internet service providers to uh, ensure that as part of their license terms and conditions that they take steps to mitigate uh, the dissemination of spam and include spam filtering techniques and so on and so forth. But my point which I want to throw out there onto, onto the table and to the community here is to uh, bring out the message that this is an uh, important area where the techno-legal dimension has to be married together in a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a carefully thought out manner to address a global problem. Thank you. So uh, I think based upon the comments from the different panelists, there was a discussion of um, a wide variety of initiatives that are already underway to deal with spam. Oh, yes. Do you want to speak to, I'm sorry, before I go on? Okay. Um, I'm Walter Natris. I'm representing the London Action Plan this afternoon, which is the anti-spam uh, community of enforcement agencies in the world. Um, I would like to take you back about 14 or 15 years from today, and let's move to 2013 uh, in between. Um, what we're talking about when we talk about spam is something which had to do with nuisance. People were receiving more and more emails in their mailboxes than regular messages. And apparently this got to such an irritating level that governments decided to do something about it. And just like Chris just mentioned, it's about unsolicited commercial email. Well, in the Netherlands it's a little bit more. It's also about unsolicited political messages and unpolicable charity, unsolicited charities. If you don't want to receive that, then it's also unsolicited in the Netherlands. So it goes one step further. Um, when that was implemented in 2004, in May 2004, in the Netherlands, I was working with the spam enforcement agencies at, at, at that date. Within half a year, 85% of identifiable Dutch language spam had simply disappeared. And that was not because of this very fierce regulatory agency, but just because most companies who were sending commercial messages did not want to be associated with fines and, and investigations by, by a regulatory uh, office. So in other words, that was very effective. Just having a law saying you have to opt in to receive messages, they'd be able to, to allow to send messages, actually was very effective. Of course, they didn't do anything for the international spam that we still receive today with the illegal bills and et cetera, et cetera. But that's an, a different sort of spam because that's not really commercial. It's about, about products that you're not allowed to sell usually, for example. So that's also a different issue. With, and from there, it became more harmful with, uh, you already told it also, Chris, it's more about spam today, it's more about how to affect a compu somebody's computer or device than it's about commercial messaging. And that's why, in my opinion, I think that maybe the laws that were drafted in 1999, I started to think about drafting in 1999, may not be as effective today as they were then. It doesn't mean to say that the regulatory framework as was developed in those days could not work as a starting point. But what everybody seems to have forgotten by now, the OECD worked on an anti-spam toolkit in 2004, 5, and 6. 
And that's an excellent starting point to look at if you want to know how to fight spam. The anti-spam toolkit is undoubtedly still somewhere on the internet, on the OECD website. And it goes to show what sort of party should be there to be successfully uh, fighting spam. And that includes industry. And industry has done its bit because, frankly, I don't receive a single spam message nowadays except, oddly enough, phishing mails always come through, but they always go to my spam box. And casino online gambling. And I get that, say, two, three a month. If we compare that what we used to receive in 2002, then actually industry seems to be doing a good job. So is spam still a problem? Industry says it isn't, but is that so for every country? And I think that that is what we should be discussing here, because from the US point of view and the Dutch point of view, spam may not really be an issue anymore, but is it the same in every country? And I think that is a question I'm going to put back to the chair, to you, to, to let us know whether it's an issue in your country or not. Yeah, I think that would be a good segue to understand perspectives from the audience. Um, when we get to that part of the discussion around how big of an issue spam is in your respective countries, um, uh, I, th I think we heard from quite a few of the panelists earlier that there, there are a lot of initiatives underway uh, to deal with spam. I know I can speak for, for uh, as Chris mentioned, the Messaging Anti-Abuse Working Group. Um, I am part of the co-chair of their public policy committee there, and um, they have been working on uh, spam uh, best practices since uh, 2003, 2004 when the organization was started and they have published um, quite a few different documents outlining best practices that have been um, uh, translated into multiple languages and are available to help uh, deal with spam and there's also other ac actions underway. Um, the London Action Plan has been very active on spam. Um, there was also a, um, uh, in, in, uh, a paper published uh, uh, by the East-West Institute that had input from MOG and the London Action Plan as well last couple years ago regarding uh, spam best practices. So I think um, one of the challenges that we have is how do we raise just general awareness of the different um, uh, tools that are out there and different practices to help deal with spam um, and how do we scale um, you know, some of those solutions into a larger framework for cooperation. So I'd like to um, ask the panelists to each kind of speak briefly to, um, uh, to that topic of how do we scale these initiatives and uh, make them more sustainable, in particular in countries that may not have um, as, as, um, as much experience in dealing with spam. So Karen, you want to go first? Yes, thank you. Uh, Karen Mulberry from the Internet Society. T to build upon um, my, my opening comment, uh, we have started looking at how do we address the, the question of what is spam and how can we help developing countries have a better understanding of, of spam and what is available for them to avail themselves of to implement not only within their country but within their regions. Um, the, you know, the project we started earlier this year is, is, as Chris mentioned, leveraging the information from MOG, which is a, a very good industry um, association that focuses on the operational aspects of managing and mitigating spam, malware, botnets, and, and other intrusive network um, activities. The London Action Plan, uh, as, as Wout mentioned, is the enforcement agencies from about 30 countries, uh, and, they're, and they're growing even more, talking about cross-border enforcement and management of spam. Um, we have been working with the GSMA in terms of SMS and text messaging spam. I mean, so there's a lot of efforts from, from some very good um, industry associations that are they're willing to share. So what we have done at the Internet Society is kind of facilitate getting that information out to various regions. We've held a couple of workshops to date and are planning more next year where we bring the experts into a region. We were in Nairobi um, in September. We were in Argentina uh, two weeks ago so that the experts and from these associations and from, from um, other venues can sit down and, and talk about how do you address 
spam, and this is spam. And, and frankly, you know, the common definition is unwanted or uns unsolicited uh, forms of electronic communication. Um, you know, when you look at the ITRs and what came out of Wicket, I mean, they were, they were focusing solely on, on bulk communication, which may or may not be um, relevant in, in, the, in the grand scheme of, of what you're trying to address. The, you know, it's all about what's unwanted or unsolicited and, and the terms and, and processes related to managing that. There's a lot of information out there, and, and there is um, at least what we're trying to facilitate is getting these experts in, in front of um, areas, governments, um, industry, and technical organizations so that they can have this exchange of, of expertise, the exchange of, of um, knowledge and administration to better arm them to make choices on what they want to do. I mean, the, the program and project we have is divided into um, three components. We're also building a toolkit to kind of build upon what OECD did with their toolkit, although it hasn't been refreshed for a number of years. So we're trying to look at this and refresh it so that we can provide the current best practices, the current codes that are in, are, are in use by networks and operators, and then uh, as well as the, the uh, litany of tools that are available. Some of them are freely available. Some of them require um, more uh, expertise and technical knowledge to implement. But we're trying to capture the list of choices and the checklists that, um, you know, in a developing country, if you want to move forward to mitigate spam, um, here's some of the things you need to think about as you go through this path to implement something. Um, you know, and beyond our workshops for policymakers, we also have workshops where we're, we're going to be doing hands-on. Um, here's network operational and management um, knowledge that we can share with you on how to better in, improve what you're doing with your own networks. And we're doing this in, in association with MOG, the London Action Plan, the GSMA, and, and other bodies that have been working for a number of years on, on how to approach and better manage spam. I think as we all know, spam, spam is one of these ills that, that you will never cure. Um, you know, the traditional spam that, that started 20 years ago when email first came about uh, it has morphed into more phishing, botnet, um, and malware infections. And so it's the delivery mechanism. So we, you know, those who want to better manage networks have to stay um, at least even w with the um, new developments that are out there for trying to delivery, deliver these um, um, infections into the system in the, in the Internet. Chris, you want to go next? Uh, yeah, uh, Chris Painter from the Department of State. Um, I should say Department of State, but I've actually had a number of jobs over the last 20 years that have dealt with cyber, including being a federal prosecutor at one point. So I, I know a lot about the cyber crime aspects of this. And, and, and let me, let me uh, uh, first of all, uh, endorse what Karen said. I think the, the first element is, and what I, we often hear, especially from developing countries, is, well, where do I go to deal with this problem? Who do I, you know, I... I'm interested in actually finding out how I can deal with this problem, who I can talk to, who has the expertise. So uh, number one uh, is to make sure that that awareness raising activity that Karen described uh, is given priority. And, and awareness raising so that countries around the world know what these forms are, know what the tool sets are that are available to them already. Uh, and that should be uh, married with capacity building. We're, you know, I'll talk more about capacity building when we talk about cyber crime and and even some of the hacking and cybersecurity issues, because they all are kind of married together. But an element of that capacity building should be how do you deal with this problem as well. And then secondly, uh, I think, it, as uh, everyone has noted, that uh, spam is increasingly a vector for other kinds of malicious attacks. So it's not just really the spam issue. It's the issue of how you deal with these malicious attacks, these you know, which are, are cyber crime in most cases and hacking, uh, and, and being used really as a, a, a point of entree into people's computer systems. Well, I, I think that requires a couple of different approaches. And again, we'll deal with this more when we get to the other areas of this panel. But 
Uh, one is uh, policies, both with respect to cybersecurity, you know, making sure that you have more secure networks, both uh, government, private industry, and and uh, um, and just ordinary citizen networks, and having policies and practices for countries around the world domestically around that. Uh, and two is having uh, good, strong cybercrime policies, strong cybercrime laws, uh, capabilities again, train law enforcement and ability to cooperate internationally. That's uh, entirely applicable to this because, again, it's a vector for some of those malicious activities. And then finally, uh, one thing I found that has been particularly helpful is to bring together the different communities. So when we're talking about spam as being a vector, uh, for malicious activity and for criminal activity. Uh, there is a law enforcement community, and we'll just talk a little bit about that. There is the technical community who are in charge of defending networks, uh, and there is uh, the private sector who has a role in this as well. And bringing those communities together, I think, is critically important. So we've done this over the years. Uh, uh, one of the things I used to do is uh, chair the G8 high-tech crime group, and we had a 24-7 point of contact network that involved uh, it still involves over 50 countries. Um, but one thing we started to do is have a joint workshop with uh, the FIRST, the Form of Incident Response and Security Teams, the technical experts there. And in the beginning, the law enforcement community and the technical community didn't really know or trust each other. But having them come together and come together with the private sector, I think it means you have a more effective response uh, to this issue. And that should be done domestically in all the countries that are dealing with this. Uh, as well. And so I think there are some practices that we can promote. There is some awareness we need to raise, and we can do both of those things. Great. Thank you. Um, Giantha, do you want to add anything? Uh, yes, Chris. Uh, Bill, I agree with uh, what, uh, uh, what both the previous speakers said. But in addition, what I just want to emphasize from a more from a developing country perspective is that uh, many of us who are involved on a very regular basis in many of these uh, technical, legal, policy discussions around cybersecurity, cybercrime, cyber threats, incident handling issues, we are very often aware of what's happening at OECD, the anti-spam anti toolkit, the work of the London Action Plan, anti-fishing working group, so on and so forth. But the bigger issue that we see from a day-to-day -day operational perspective in our own home countries is that these developments happening around various sectors often don't percolate down to the grassroots level uh, uh, communities. And often uh, we find uh, some of these documentation uh, available only in English. And of course, I know that uh, once we told somebody at OECD, why not translate the anti-spam tool toolkit and at least into multiple languages? And I think there was some response to that. But some of the activity happening in this area are only available in English. So there is no problem with it. But at least some kind of summaries and take-home points and safeguards that should be taken at a technical level, ISP level, or at the user level should be available in multiple languages. And I believe efforts are underway um, from uh, various organizations to get that in place. Uh, my final point, Chris, is that uh, this is a subject, spam is a subject requiring as I said earlier, the techno-legal dimensions to be merged together. And countries may increasingly need to have cyber security strategies as part of their national uh, security strategy. And in that, it is worthwhile considering whether we should have an element to uh, uh, prevent this problem from blowing out of proportion and there is a need to act fast in that connection through uh, a coordinated cyber security strategies globally. Thank you. Um, I believe that our, um, before I switch over, I believe that our, our uh, chairman would like to make a comment as well based upon the last comments. And then I'll turn it over to you if you don't mind. Thank you, Moderator. I just want, uh, I would like to add uh, 
some uh, issue that might be forgot to uh, explore. That the first one uh, uh, talking about the uh, privacy uh, in this context. Uh, to what extent we can say that the co unsolicited bug communication for commercial is uh, against the privacy, particularly for the consumer protection rights. So if we refer to only from the business perspective side, spamming, it must be okay. But for the every user's perspective, everything come to my box, it means had already used my space. So in this context, we would better also to explore to what extent different spamming through internet and spamming through mobile phone. Because the essence of the law, it's quite different. The basic principles of the conventional communication is a private communication. It doesn't, mean, uh, it, it doesn't mean that everybody can call anyone. But for the communication through internet, is the mass communication. So since the beginning, maybe you have a right to say hello to anybody and send uh, a commercial mail. So I'm ad just adding that, that might be uh, some aspect that for be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Woot, do you have any additional comments? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, that was Walter Natris. Um, that I think on the behalf of the London Action Plan, that what I think one of the things they actually offer to the world is the, the knowledge of fighting spam for years. And what is on offer is training individuals how to fight spam and what sort of tools are needed to fight spam, and that's the sort of knowledge that's available there. So it's basically an invitation to, to, to join the London Action Plan if you're thinking about drafting a spam law or you're thinking about starting an agency or you have an agency that has just started. But what I understand is what one, of the, one of the problems is the London Action Plan is now actually having its own meeting at this moment together with Mork already mentioned here in Montreal. They started Yes, uh, today also. So that's why I, as a private consultant, am now uh, representing the London Action Plan, which I'm actually am a member of uh, from the from the the, the, the commercial uh, side of, uh, of of and spam fighting. Um, one of the problems are basically that this training is now in Montreal, and it's not possible for for each country to travel there easily. And on the other side, in the London Action Plan, there's no money to travel to the rest of the world to give these sort of trainings. So in other words, there's some sort of a mismatch happening here between the demand and supply. And I'm not the one that has a, the possibility to offer a solution for that, but it's something that maybe the, the, the right sort of authority should be looking at how it's made possible that these sort of trainings actually do start to happen around the world. So I think that's an important thing to look at. The other thing is that is it completely clear with the London Action Plan what the questions exactly are? Is, is the demand the same as what is on offer at this moment? And that's, I think, something which is worthwhile looking into also. And as far as I'm aware of, that has not happened so far. So I think that's uh, another way to try and build capacity. But it's, it, it is a problem getting the people together, apparently. I think um, uh, that specific topic of how do we um, expand um, some of the activities of MOG and London Action Plan into other countries um, is an area that is being actively worked on. I know Karen mentioned the partnership that has been started between ISOC and MOG. Uh, MOG itself is um, establishing uh, a foundation uh, basically to support ongoing uh, to support ongoing um, training sessions in other countries, so really taking it out of just doing the kind of... Uh, MOG traditionally has three meetings a year, um, one of which is international. Um, I think they recognize the need to be more active in other countries, and I think the partnership with ISOC is largely intended uh, to help them uh, take their technical expertise um, and expand it more globally um, to help educate folks on different um, uh, techniques to deal with spam. And I don't know, Karen, if you have anything to add to that. Yes, thank you. Uh, Karen Mulberry with the Internet Society. 
Indeed, that's what we're doing. We're also translating documents, both log documents and, and other materials that have been de developed by experts in the field so that they are available in the, um, um, the UN languages, and in particular French, English, and Spanish, to make sure that, that you know, where they need to be used, they're, they're in a form and, and, and text and, and concept that can be used by the, by the people who are so eager for that information. Uh, I mean, we have run across that in, in many different uh, venues where, where they really need to better understand it in French versus English. Um, and we also need to look at the technical tone of a lot of these documents that have been developed over, year, over the years to make sure that they are understandable in many languages and, and, and they provide some context uh, in relation to, to in, at least the toolkit that we're trying to assemble so that you understand the first step you need to take and here's some material that might be useful for you to uh, um, educate yourself, to expose yourself to some of the choices that are out there so that you can discern for your own country or your own network what are the appropriate steps for you to take because it's going to be individual in terms of what you want to implement um, and how you want to manage it but we try to lay out all of the details that you need to consider in the process because it's very important. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so we're about quarter after, so I wanted to um, ask if we have any audience questions. I believe we have one over here, um, and I'd like to remind um, folks with questions that they should please introduce themselves um, when they ask. Gracias, buenas tardes a todos. Good afternoon and hello to everybody. I'm going to speak Spanish, if I may, because that's my mother tongue. My name is Mayu Fumo, and I am the commissioner for the telecoms regulatory body for Mexico, which was set up after a constitutional reorganization of telecommunications in my country and it covers broadcasting and telecommunications in general and everything to do with the computer sector. What I think is interesting and what we see here is the fact that there has been such a strong effort to minimize what's coming up in the wicked sector and as head of this agency in Mexico, I know that we have signed all the final acts of all these international agreements, along with other South American countries like Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay, Argentina, the Dominican Republic, and other non-South American countries like Korea and Singapore, too. Brazil, of course, is at the top of the list. Many other countries, too, have signed those same agreements. But there is this constant attempt to minimize the issue by saying it's just a question of capacity building and so on. But actually, of course, it's obvious that we do need the capacity building. People need to know what they're doing. They need the knowledge that is part of this. But when you're the regulator for international telecommunications, you uh, can't use the word spam because lots of countries were opposed to the word spam being used in the text. So instead of talking about spam, we talked about massive non-solicited non -solicited electronic communications and about the measures that would be necessary to take in order to combat the sending of these sort of communications and minimize their effect and that the member states promised that they would cooperate in this field, that it is an international problem. That's the point, not a local problem. Certainly a lot of work has been done in this area, but we need to increase international communication. The last thing we need to do is minimize the, country, the problem by pretending that it's just a question of needing more knowledge and needing more technological and technical capacity. Spam started arising 20 years ago. It's been around for a while. And we also need 
to take into account the opinions that we have from the wicket experts. In my case, I've been working on the technical aspects, both at the national level and at the international level, in this area. And we work, for instance, together with Japan, and we've learned from that that we need our interventions to be much more effective. Spam isn't just to do with the capacity or the knowledge available in one country. It is to do with national security, for instance, of a country. And Mexico is a good example of that. In Mexico, we saw that in some areas, we have an awful lot of email that is sent from laptops to uh, people who, when the person clicks on a link within the body of the email, what they are doing is they are calling a police line for emergencies. So these criminals are using the system to saturate, to completely overwhelm the police emergency line and stop the police from doing their job. And in order to set up something like that, you need huge capacity in the criminal world. So we need an international strategy to combat that kind of attack. So that is why it needs to be part and parcel of international telecommunications regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do any of the panelists would they like to um, speak to the issues that were just raised? No. Uh, Chris Painter uh, from the State Department. I, I don't think that people should confuse uh, whether uh, people thought it was appropriate for spam to be a topic in the Wicket meeting, which did not, by its nature, deal with content issues, uh, and uh, whether people thought that spam was a legitimate concern of countries around the world. I think everyone believes that it's a legitimate concern that we should address. And I don't think that uh, anyone should think that we don't uh, believe there should be international cooperation uh, on this issue. And I, don't, I also don't think I heard any of my fellow panelists here say that uh, uh, you know, these are local solutions that should be adopted. That's one part of it, yes. But these are also solutions that have been uh, talked about that would help the international community cooperate better against these issues. Now, I think the, the issue in part comes when you start talking about uh, uh, making the jump between international cooperation to deal with these threats. And when they, when they end up being um, uh, law enforcement threats or cybersecurity threats, uh, those need to be addressed by strengthening those capabilities, just like we have in other types of threat areas. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that is the subject of uh, a telecommunications, international telecommunications regulatory scheme. So I, I think we have to disaggregate this issue a little bit and make sure we're, we're looking at the best and most effective solutions, both domestically for countries and also how they work together and cooperate together. Um, thank you. Um, I believe we may have some remote participation as well. Um, well, we have one comment from Mr. Robert Lubanga from Yusuyu Kampala. He commented that we need to do a lot more to make the developing countries have trust in Internet and what we do. There must be strategies to stop cybercrime. He also have, has one question. How can we help developing countries like Uganda appreciate the value of Internet without being trapped in the cycles of cybercrime. Thank you. Does anyone want to speak to that particular question? I, I, can, I can start. I mean, I, we're sort of jumping ahead in the panel in terms yeah. of we're going to be discussing cybercrime at the end, but, but I do think um, that there is, uh, you know, the reason you have good cybercrime laws the reason you have good cybercrime capabilities, the reason you have international cooperation to deal with cybercrime, all issues we'll be talking about later in the panel, uh, is to address the threats on the Internet, but uh, to promote the good things we're trying to do on the Internet, whether it's commerce or social interaction, 
uh, all of the kind of cybersecurity policies and cybercrime capacity building and also abilities to do cybercrime enforcement are not ends in themselves, but a way to enable that kind of trust and that kind of uh, commercial development. So we should do that. Uh, and how do you get countries, uh, particularly developing countries, uh, uh, to uh, adopt g good policies in this area. Well, that's really where we go to some of the capacity building efforts. And we've run quite a bit of that uh, around the world. Uh, the United States has, other countries has. There's, there's a lot of emphasis on that. I, I'll address that more when we get to the cybercrime section. Uh, I come from a conference that was just held in Seoul, South Korea, the cyber, uh, Seoul Conference on Cyberspace. And one of the themes of that conference was the important of capacity building around the world and building cooperative networks to deal with some of these cyber crime issues that involve really the entire world. So uh, I think there's some good efforts underway, uh, but the reason we do all of that is to enable better trust in the networks and to enable the kind of economic and social growth on those networks. Uh, thank you. Um, Uh, this is Walter Nates. I'd like to try to tackle both questions uh, a little bit. Um, I'm not a diplomat, so I was not at the wicket. Uh, I'm just speaking personally here from the top of my head. Is that when there's spam, it's called spam here in this, in this uh, uh, panel, in the Dutch legislation, which is a trans translation more or less from the, the EU uh, policy directive, the word spam isn't used a single time. It's unsolicited commercial, uh, what is the other one, political or charity uh, communications. So that's that's the official word. And we call it spam because that's the popular word for it, and it just because of this funny Monty Python uh, flying circus uh, sketch on spam, which was the only thing you could get in a restaurant was spam, spam, spam. And that's where the joke comes from, basically. So. The next thing is to, 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 to take away cyber cybercrime. When we talk about spam, so unsolicited communication, we mean where the content is commercial. So as soon as it's not commercial anymore and it goes into phishing, it goes into to, to infecting, trying to infect end users' devices uh, and to be able to DDoS or spam more or whatever they do with it. I think that's going into a different discussion because then you're moving from spam unsolicited commercial communication into fraud or crimes or worse. So in other words, then you get away from the, in, in the way it was called cybercrime. And then the, 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 the spamming, the sending of the messages is nothing else than a, device, a tool to reach another goal. Then the question, can you avoid common cybercrime coming into a country? Yes, if you throw away every device in your country and not connect to the Internet. So in other words, it's, it's the same as happening on the street. I think law enforcement is there since the late 18th century, and it's not like crime has gone away because of it, but it keeps most people away from crime, and it keeps most people safer. But you can always be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And in real life, you can re usually see which streets you'd want to enter and which street you may not want to enter, but even then you can be hit by a bus because the driver's drunk. There's no guarantee. And that, but the f fact is you can't see the bus coming on the Internet. You don't know if there's a driver and you don't know whether he's drunk or not. So in other words, there, that's where maybe this discussion should be going. How can you push the crime back as far as possible, as becomes acceptable, like just like in real life, and then you have a society we can actually profit as much as possible from the internet with all the beautiful things it also gives us and 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 and, and presents to the world. Lots of opportunities, business opportunities, but also for personal people. And I think that that is where the distinction between spam and the content of the spam has to be made. Jantha. Uh, thanks, uh, Chris. I, I think I will uh, answer, uh, answer that specific question from the remote participant on uh, how the Internet can be promoted without getting caught in the cyber crime trap, uh, if I have understood that question right. Uh, so basically, uh, not just governments, uh, from a developing country perspective, I think everybody in the community uh, the te technical community, the internet uh, uh, communities in your country 
has an obligation to promote the good side of the internet. Uh, in fact, Chris also brought this out. Uh, yes, we need to uh, governments uh, or uh, and 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 the uh, in internet community has to address the threats associated with cybercrime, and there are best practice models available for that, which we will be discussing later on today. But the negative side arising from cybercrime should not be uh, brought out in a way that will stifle the innovation and the growth that a country can have uh, with the powerful tool associated with the internet. And from a developing country uh, myself, I mean, uh, in Sri Lanka, we see this problem uh, 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 as a big issue because the local press often brings out the Facebook abuses, the frauds associated with internet banking to many other issues, and those are given first page uh, news items in our newspapers often. But talk of the good side of how the economy has been uh, uh, made to leapfrog with the internet-based tools. Those are given um, second, third page uh, small news items. So this is a problem that many developing countries are facing and uh, many organizations, uh, the governments themselves can't grapple with that problem and they can't, cannot themselves promote the good side of the internet. And I think uh, uh, talking of that Ugandan uh, remote participants question, the question I would pose back to him is, do you for example have a internet uh, society, local chapter in your country that can help to promote the good side of the internet. And talking from Sri Lanka, I can tell you that the positive sides of the internet was greatly promoted thanks to the best efforts of our internet society local chapter. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and so we have a few more questions here from the audience. So why don't we go around this way? So you want to start there? Yes. You're next. Yes. Oh. Uh, microphone, please. And just a reminder to please introduce yourself. Thank you. Actually, it's not a, a question. I think uh, the chairman raised an important point that in solving spam issues, it is important to have consumer views and also consumer and so maybe it will not uh, ills that never been cured. We, we still can reduce the negative impact of it. So because the consumers have the right to enjoy the benefits of the ICTs, like you said, and also uh, when they enjoy the benefit of ICT to the maximum level, without interference or annoying information, which is not based on their consent. So because that's also the role of uh, government and also uh, responsibility of all sectors, include the business sectors. Thus, I think it is necessary that in regulating spam, consumers should given more flexibility to choose whether or not they want the information. So. If, if we see the condition now, many times consumers have no rights to choose. It's all like a take it or leave it basis. If you want it, then you have to agree with all uh, the restrictions and all the, uh, the requirements. So it is important for, for, for the global community to support the regulations that give the consumers more flexibility in choosing uh, the information they want. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next. And, and a reminder to please introduce yourself. Um, Gracias, Mr. Chairman, por darme la palabra. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor again. Uh, I would like to ask something. I think that we who participate in this conference, we have a tendency to minimize what we don't understand. 
That was the commercial spam in legislation. And we know we have the context. This is a reality. Spam is a reality. International communications regulations, for people who aren't familiar, these are regulations which are very interesting, which make it possible to understand a great deal. It says clearly that it's nothing to do with the content. The problem is that the information comes as spam on mobiles, for example, mobile phones. And the user thinks that it's an app which is coming for free. And they think that they're going to get a photo or a song or something. And then they click. And it calls a police call center. So imagine the quantity of calls that can come in simultaneously if that's done to the police. So it stops the police from working, that doing their proper work. This is linked to the question of cyber security and cyber crime. It's here where we are asking us to not remain aside from this, that we should try to find some definition and a strategy so that these new kinds of situations which are coming up, not just on the internet, but in other international communications also have to be dealt with. I'd like to ask if any of the panelists would like to respond. Yes, this is Karen Mulberry from the Internet Society. I, I can tell you that the technical community has taken note of issues like that. The IETF, the um, Internet Engineering Task Force, actually has created a group to address issues that, that are IP related, where um, because of VOIP or or other um, internet voice calling, there there have been calls to um, emergency services, to to police centers, and everything else. And they're working on on technical solutions for networks, on authenticating traffic, so that they you, there's a means of addressing what's malicious and and inappropriate on a network, so that the the you know the the government agencies you rely upon in in an emergency and in a disaster and to provide the, the protective services are not overwhelmed and prevented from actually doing the job that they are supposed to be doing. So there is work underway. There isn't a solution that has been, been um, you know, formally adopted yet, but there's a lot of discussion and there's a lot of motivation to come up with, with a solution, not necessarily um, uh, the same as addressing spam, but they're looking at, at this as, as the, uh, a malicious network activity that they need to manage better. So work is underway, and, and hopefully soon there will be some solutions out there. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Um, it looks like we have several more questions to get through. Um, let me go to the gentleman here at the end of the table, and then I will go to the remote participants, and then a couple more gentlemen back here. Um, and a reminder to please introduce yourself um, when you have questions. All right. My name is Jay Sadowski. Um, I own and operate a uh, internet infrastructure company in the United States, and I find it a little interesting that most of the panel seems to think that spam is limited to commercial or unsolicited commercial emails. Um, from my perspective, um, you know, I, I operate a lot of mail servers. I don't go and and deploy an anti-spam product that only addresses unsolicited commercial emails. Uh, you know, it needs to address all of the different unsolicited kind of emails that we're getting. Phishing, malware, uh, identity theft. Uh, you know, it, it, so I, I would really encourage the IGF, if they're trying to uh, produce a takeaway, that uh, they include all these different subsets of spam in whatever, in whatever they develop, because to have it be limited just to uh, unsolicited commercial email seems to, to do a disservice, especially if, uh, to, to the larger international community if they're trying to develop a, 
best practices and, and training and, and things like that to, to you know, limit the, the scope of that. Uh, the, the other aspect of this, uh, from my perspective, is that um, spam that is not simply unsolicited commercial email is most definitely tied to cybercrime in every way. Uh, spam facilitates phishing, identity theft, malware. Um, spammers use stolen identities to sign up for fraudulent services. Spammers develop malware to steal credentials from uh, end users and then hijack their email accounts. Uh, spammers send out spam to get people to sign up for uh, fake credit report services. Uh, you, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an ongoing cycle, um, but spam and unwanted email is, is essential to what uh, a lot of these cyber crime outfits are doing. Um, thank you. And um, I'll ask the panelists to respond. I do think just one quick comment is that I do think there's different definitions for spam and um, different groups define it differently. I know like at MOG, they generally define, um, they don't even mention the spam. Most of their practices are really related to unwanted email, kind of to your point. So um, any of the panelists have a comment there? So, I mean, there, uh, this is why we said the top, I think Karen and I both, Chris Painter, uh, again, uh, both Karen and I said we needed to find our terms here. And uh, yes, there are different kinds of activities we're seeing. Uh, spam is sometimes an enabler, but what we're really talking about is emails. It do doesn't necessarily mean that spam, it could be targeted. In fact, what we're seeing in phishing more often now than we did ever before is spear phishing and much more targeted emails, so not the wide distribution of things out there. Uh, so then what we're really talking about is malicious activity, which we're going to be dealing with later on in this panel and cyber, you know, in the uh, hacking and cyber crime part. And absolutely, we need to uh, make sure we're combating that malicious activity. And that's an international issue where, uh, where I think uh, the IGF can play a role in making, uh, again, uh, making clear what's out there and where the activities are being done and the legal structures that need to be done around cybercrime laws uh, and, uh, and capacity to fight cybercrime and investigate cybercrime. Because even the example our, our, uh, our uh, colleague from Mexico brought up, you know, trying to get the police jam, that's a crime. And so how do you address those criminal aspects? How do you make sure you can investigate them both within your country and work internationally because they often are not localized in one country? Those are important issues that we need to address. So there is no, uh, at least from my part, and I don't think from any of the panelists' part, there's no uh, uh, attempt to minimize this by calling spam one thing and malicious activity another. We need to address both of those uh, issues. And I think we will during the course of this discussion. Yes. So, um, I think you're absolutely totally right. Of course, there's much more than just unsolicited commercial or whatever email. The fact is I'm representing the London Action Plan, which is all about commercial uh, unsolicited email. So that's the story I'm giving here. Um, if I look at my background as a spam enforcement agency, the trouble we usually run into is that there's a lot happening on the content except our law anti-spam law does not give us any rights to do something about the content. For that you need the police. And to be quite frank and honest here, the, the, if we walked up to the police in those days and said we have a fraud case here involving that many millions of euros, then basically there were the, the question was where's the body? Oh, no body, uh, they'll see you again. And there was just no interest. So, and that it appears to be changing a little bit, I hear from my ex-colleagues, that they're doing the first two cases ever together, which is completely new, and I think that's a good example of what the, the, the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice is doing through the National Cyber Security Center by bringing all different stakeholders, public, private, together and make task forces out of them on, on, on issues. Perhaps we have time later to, to, to discuss that. But what I also said in my introduction, the law that was thought about in 1999 and drafted in 2001 and implemented in 2003 or 4 may not be doing what it's supposed to do nowadays because there's so much more than just commercial emails. So maybe it's time to start looking as uh, a law uh, capacity people and drafting, or drafting laws and policy people to look at what sort of a law would you like to have in 2016, because that's about the cycle we have from 2013 onwards, of course, is whether 
the a sort of agencies that are effective now, like the Federal Trade Commission, like the, the, the OPTA where I used to work, now called ACM, and a few others around the world, is could they actually assist in these sort of cases where the police, from an economic point of view, is not interested enough because the cases are clearly not serious enough, but still involving millions which are being siphoned off the economy, would it be of interest to see if these sort of organizations could actually take on these cases also by being allowed to look at the content and perhaps also bring somebody to a criminal court instead just to a civil or an administrative court? And that may be frightened away some more people that now think, well, the fine of 10,000 euros and I'm making a million, I'll go on anyway. So in other words, the, 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 the matter of fining and the, the, the profits they make may not also be not compatible. So that's something, some food for thought for the future. What sort of law would you like to have in 2016 or 17? And would it have to be different than it is now? Uh, thank you, Woot. Um, I believe we are, for the sake of time, I'll take a few more questions on spam. I think as Chris has pointed out a few times, we're kind of uh, conflating topics here between spam and the hacking question and also cybercrime. So we'll move on to hacking next. Um, but let me um, take the last couple questions here before we do. I think we had one more online participant, I believe. Uh, actually, two. First two. one is from Daniel Nanghaka from Kenya. Uh, he commented that the issue of legislation is for the key stakeholders who are government and civil society. And from Mr. Gideon, my point is on continued review of legislations. Countries, especially from developing nations, have to custom design their legislations and get enough input from all stakeholders in order to develop proper and acceptable cyber legislation. Thank you. Seems like those were both comments. I don't know if we have any any response there. Okay. Um, we have two more. Yes, next. And please introduce yourself. Thank you. I, I'm John Laprise. I'm a professor at Northwestern University. Uh, and this is a question specifically for Karen. Earlier, we talked about how the IETF is interacting with our colleague from Mexico's issues um, on the network. If we're thinking of spam as a problem for network stability, um, you know, back in, sorry, I've got one up, a uh, page up on my iPad, but back in 1999, IETF was looking at best practices for dealing with spam. Is the IETF still actively working on this issue if we're framing it as a network stability issue? This would be another way to both build capacity and disseminate capacity through the engineering uh, community. Thank you. So if I can respond, I, I believe that the IETF is still working on um, network management and network stability uh, issues. Do they call it spam? No. They have moved on to, to more specific um, management of um, uh, the elements within a network. I mean, to, to the uh, group that I mentioned before, it's called the STIR Working Group. And, and it, if you know IETF, they like to come up with very interesting acronyms to define the working groups that are doing something. And I'm not sure I can uh, explain the acronym for, for that group. But it's an, a newly formed group, and, and they are actively pursuing how do you do network authentication to validate that, that um, the, the sender and the receiver should be um, allow the traffic to complete. Uh, I mean, so there, there's a lot of activities that are occurring to better manage um, instances that are malicious um, and improve the efficiency of networks. There are a lot of other initiatives that could be undertaken as well, in, in, you know, in, uh, compatible with, with what the uh, Internet Engineering Task Force is working on, too. I mean, much like MOG and some of the other places, they are working on the operational aspects of, of these things. I know that GSMA has a very active initiative on SMS spam and, and what their, their network operators, the mobile operators, need to do um, to better manage that, to prevent all of the issues that, that you know, a lot of countries have because they, they have an overwhelming amount of SMS spam out there. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, 
think that that is it for the audience questions. Uh, we have one more back in the back. Um. Thank you. Uh, my name is Pete Resnick. Uh, my expertise is on the technical end of things, but I actually wanted to ask a question about the legal end. I've been involved in several civil suit anti-spam cases in the U.S., and the law in the U.S. seems more or less completely ineffective because the folks who are large enough to really be dealing with spam, the Googles, the Yahoos, the other large providers of the world, they use the technical tools to prevent spam and not the law, which leaves the law to be used by, shall we say, less reputable plaintiffs. And we hear of a lot of cases dismissed because those folks are not considered real internet service providers, real mail service providers. And it seems to me that allowing some more of these cases to go forward and to allow anyone to make these claims to get the money out of commercial spam. I'm not talking about here um, cybercrime. I'm talking about strictly commercial spam, which is in the gray market of spam. There should be some way to adjust these laws to get folks out of making spam profitable. And I was wondering if the panelists would be willing to comment on changes to the laws such that any single individual could bring suit against large folks who are taking advantage of the fact that there are more nefarious players willing to send spam. I'm thinking of people who are large companies but allow botnet-like um, mail senders to send spam and make money on their backs. Would anyone care to comment? Doesn't. Do you, would, you, would you like to comment? I'll try to comment. Um, if I remember correctly, that Microsoft had done that a couple of times in the U.S. by bringing people to court. And, uh, and I'm not an expert on U.S. law, but I think I remember the FTC saying once that every individual in the United States can bring a spammer to court. And whether that's a successful approach or not, that's something different. But, uh, but maybe there's somebody in the room who can check that fast on the Internet or knows it. But I think I saw that in a presentation once. Well, I, I can briefly comment on some of the work. That, I don't know if anybody from Microsoft is here. But they've done quite a bit of work with um, law enforcement to do um, various takedowns of some large botnets, which has had a substantial impact on the volume of spam. I know that there was a... I forget the name of the particular botnet, but a couple of years ago, um, they took down um, a, a, a botnet that uh, I think reduced um, spam by a very large percentage worldwide, actually. Um, if, um, there's, so there's been a lot of activity, um, at least in, their, in that instance, um, to do that. And also, um, when, it, when you talk about, and we're kind of, again, segueing into the hacking issue, but when you talk a little bit about mal malware, um, a lot of the ISPs as well have worked with uh, Microsoft and others and the FBI in the United States to try to um, alleviate some of those issues. A good example of that is the DNS changer botnet that was dealt with um, last year. So I think there is, um, there is activities from some of the larger players on the Internet to try to deal with some of these challenges. Uh, yeah, and as I said at the top there, there's been some very successful enforcement actions by the FTC for deceptive practices. Uh, and there's also been some pretty big successful criminal cases uh, involving uh, that act, the Can Spam Act. And uh, I'm sorry, if you'd be willing to allow me one follow-up. Um, I was, in fact, not talking about the criminal aspects. Um, I'm wondering more about the civil aspects for individuals being able to go after commercial spammers that are using botnets to their advantage, certainly, but going after the people who generate the revenue, the, the commercial gain, from sending out these commercial emails, that doesn't seem to be available to individuals, at least in the U.S. Yeah, I don't know that I can comment to that. I don't know if any other panelists can as well. It's kind of a U.S. law 
issue. So we'll have to table that question. <laughs> All right. Um, any other audience questions on spam? I think I'd like to move on to the next question, if I can. Do you have a question? Do you want? Yes, uh, the chairman would like to make a quick comment, and then what I'm going to do is then we're going to switch to uh, hacking. Thank you. Di Indonesia itu termasuk sebagai perbuatan. In Indonesia, it is regarded bawah perdata. Gugatan perdata dapat civil case, and this can be conducted by all actions that are being taken and creates a loss for others. In Indonesia. Act, conduct, and based on the article of the law of EIT and also civil code, we can sue them in civil cases instead of the criminal also. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right. Um, so that closes the discussion on spam. Um, I think we've tackled a few of the other topics during the course of the conversation. Um, but the next subject is really um, hacking and then, uh, and then cyber crime. So focusing on hacking, which I think we're going to define for the sake of the panel as really cybersecurity issues um, more broadly, um, I'd really like to just get everyone's initial comments on um, just general discussion of um, how they see uh, cybersecurity um, you know, from a global perspective. Um, and then also just generally uh, feedback on different legal frameworks and law enforcement cooperation, you know, what's working or what needs to be streamlined and strengthened um, to deal with um, uh, cybersecurity hacking issues. So um, who wants to go first? Looks like Chris is going to be first up again. <laughs> Uh, well, I, I've been, as I mentioned at the top, I've had a lot of experience with this since I, uh, for many years, uh, uh, back in the 90s, I was a federal prosecutor going after hacking uh, crimes and other crimes back when people uh, weren't as, I think, dependent on the Internet. Uh, and then um, back in the beginning of the Obama administration, I moved to the White House to help write our cybersecurity strategy uh, and our international strategy, and now with the State Department. So I've seen different aspects of it. And you may recall that during his campaign, the first time President Obama's uh, uh, website was hacked into. So uh, he certainly was very aware of the issues and was really uh, leading the effort in trying to uh, strengthen cybersecurity, both domestically and internationally, from the day he came into office. Um, we've been doing quite a bit in this area over, over the last, uh, really, 20 years, and, and particularly over the last uh, uh, five or six years. There's been a lot of activity, including uh, having national strategies in this area, and, and, uh, and it was mentioned by uh, my one of our panelists, the importance of national strategies. I think there are something like uh, 25 countries now that have uh, cybersecurity strategies or are working on those strategies. I think it's a very important thing to raise the awareness of this issue, both within the government but also within the, the public and the business sector in, in various countries. Um, the, you know, it, it, those strategies in the U.S. and elsewhere, I think they're the strongest when they are built, uh, much like on the IGF model in a multi-stakeholder way that includes the private sector and civil society from the beginning. And indeed, our strategies had a lot of input from, from both of those groups as we, we built this out. Uh, and I'm very glad to be able to discuss these issues here. Uh, since Baku last year, where we talked about this issue, uh, we have taken some more steps uh, with respect to uh, cybersecurity, and I want to share those with you. In February of this year, President Obama uh, issued an executive order uh, and a presidential policy directive on cybersecurity and critical infrastructure uh, that clarifies both government agencies' activities in the area uh, and puts in place a cybersecurity framework for the development of standards and best practices. Uh, in rolling out that executive order, the White House characterized the current cyber environment as the, quote, new normal, unquote, uh, one in which cybersecurity threats are increasingly broad, sophisticated, and dangerous, uh, and include persistent intrusions, privacy violations, uh, theft of business information, and trade secrets, something that has been in the news quite a bit over the last year and been raised by our president in particular, and degradation and denial of service to legitimate entities trying to do business 
or get their message out on the Internet. Uh, so how do we deal with this new normal, uh, especially in an international collaborative way? Well, domestic efforts like our own executive order should be supported by international collaboration on strategies that address the transnational nature of these various threats to our networked information systems. We need to find ways to share the burden of network defense across stakeholders and also across the globe. Key elements of those efforts are prevention, preparedness, and response, and we have both policy and practical ways to achieve those goals together. From a policy perspective, we're utilizing international venues to affirm the need for international cooperation. Uh, since 2000, for instance, uh, there are five UN uh, General Assembly resolutions that have drawn attention to the essential defensive major, nature measures that governments can perform to reduce the risk to their security uh, and uh, also uh, tout the importance of raising awareness. Um, uh, they advance some very useful concepts that we need to look at, uh, including a resolution that uh, talked about the role of governments in combating the criminal misuse of information technology and underscoring the need to have modern, effective national laws to adequately prosecute cybercrime and facilitate timely transnational investigations and cooperation. Uh, another resolution that talked about creating a culture of cybersecurity, uh, drawn off some work that was done in the OECD and elsewhere, and the protection of critical information infrastructures providing an essential basis for, for facilitating international collaboration and risk reduction. Uh, yet another one that dealt with uh, the uh, responsibility of governments working with other stakeholders to lead all elements of society to understand their roles and responsibilities with regard to cybersecurity and the complementary efforts that stakeholders need to address. And still another that talked about the important roles of regional and international organizations, in particular uh, in uh, combating cybercrime. And while, the, while these UN General Assembly resolutions uh, have been a valuable forum for the promotion of these fundamental concepts, uh, the UN is not the venue, we believe, uh, where most of the real substantive international collaboration is taking place. And we don't believe the UN should be control or manage this collaboration. Uh, relevant cyberspace issues, cybersecurity and cyberspace issues, are on the agenda of many other regional and international organizations which, which we support, including the OAS, the Organization for American States, uh, the ASEAN group, uh, the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, APEC, uh, uh, OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, the African Union, um, the OECD, the Group of Eight, uh, the EU, and the Council of Europe, among others. One thing we hear a lot from other countries is that they feel the lack of expertise to implement these goals nationally and collaborate internationally, and we are very sensitive and, I think, attuned to that, uh, hearing that from countries around the world. And therefore, and I mentioned this a little early, earlier, international cyber capacity building is a policy priority for us in the U.S., and we think it be, should be a policy priority really for all. We are partnering with developed and developing countries to improve and expand the capacity building efforts to, uh, for example, provide the necessary knowledge, training, and other resources to countries seeking to build technical and cybersecurity capacity. Uh, this element was a real focus in the Seoul Conference, and I commend the, um, the output of that conference, the chair summary uh, and, and discussion of capacity building in particular to this audience. Uh, we also uh, work to continue to develop and uh, regularly share international cybersecurity best practices around the world and enhance states' abilities to find, uh, to find uh, cybercrime, including training for law enforcement, uh, forensic specialists, jurists, and legislatures. Our international capacity building work is increasing, and we've done a lot of work, particularly uh, in, the, in Africa, in the West and East Africa, and in doing regional conferences, from digital forensics to training to support the development of regional cybersecurity frameworks and strategies. Uh, and a lot of the regional organizations have been working on this, uh, too. Uh, but this is one, only one of the uh, practical measures that I think are, are, I referred to are required here. There are existing technical standards-based forms that we talked about uh, earlier with respect to spam that apply in this uh, in cybersecurity as well. And we think that discussions here could help uh, both make countries where, more aware of this and, and raise the bar by uh, by getting countries to adopt national strategies and cooperate internationally. Now that's separate, what I've said is related to, but separate than the cybercrime elements. And, and of course, having strong cybersecurity laws in place um, 
we believe modeled after the uh, modeled after by either accession to or modeled after the Budapest Cybercrime Convention is very important and having that ability to cooperate. But I, we'll get more into that, or I'll get more into that at least when we discuss the cyber crime aspects of this issue. Thank you, Chris. Um, other panelists? Yeah. You want to go? Right. I think, I believe Jayantha would like to comment as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chris. Well, um, from a, again, from an emerging country perspective, uh, cybercrime and cybersecurity are uh, both important subjects and there is a need for uh, legislative measures to deal with uh, this global phenomenon. Even in our country, from my experience, what I can share with the audience is that with the uh, huge focus given over the last seven to eight years on a development, uh, economic development activity associated with information and communication strategies, we saw a lot of uh, uh, hacking related offenses, uh, phishing of internet banking uh, websites to uh, uh, denial of services attacks uh, 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 against use of ICT in the country. And added to that was the issue of terrorism where uh, this uh, cyber crime uh, uh, tools were used uh, against the state and non-state players uh, more from a terrorism point of view. So uh, having gone through that cycle, uh, Sri Lanka uh, adopted a fairly comprehensive cyber security strategy uh, which included uh, the legislative side that we will talk about later <coughs> to couple with a technical approach to dealing with the problem and the technical side of it uh, led to the establishment of a national coordination center called the Sri Lanka CERT. So the CERT, the technical coordination work associated with CERTs, working together with the first, the forum for incidents response teams uh, in collaboration with AP CERT led to a healthy collaborative ecosystem to deal with a common problem that uh, Chris, Payne, uh, Chris Painter uh, explained a short while ago. From the legal side of it, well, the issue is significant. Countries can have different models in terms of their legislative practices, but the important point to realize is that there is increasingly a need for global cooperation in the subject of cybercrime. One country alone cannot deal with the problem. Even if we have an investigation in our country, we have to deal or contact law enforcement either in UK or United States or some parts of Europe, in Japan, Australia, China or wherever it may be. There is a need for global collaboration and therefore there is a need for harmonization. And that was one of the reasons why Sri Lanka opted to adopt the framework associated with the Budapest Convention that we will talk about later. And the need for harmonization and collaboration is the most important thing because mutual legal assistance between countries are becoming more and more complex to deal with the subject of cybercrime. Uh, so I'll stop at that for the time being. Okay. Uh, Woot. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm going to do something very uncharacteristic uncorre here and give the okay. microphone to somebody else. Um, I'm also representing NLIGF here, and we're going to do two, two sessions tomorrow on, exa on examples of the, the sort of thing we're talking about, how you, how you can actually uh, deal with threats and the sort of the capacity building that is taking place there and cooperation taking place there. I'm going to uh, pass the microphone to Nina Janssen of the Dutch uh, Ministry of Security and Justice, and she, she will say something about how major security incidents or hacks in companies or government is being dealt with in the Netherlands since last year. And Nina, the microphone is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So my name is Nina Janssen. I'm with the Dutch Ministry of Security and Justice. Um, since you were taking the 
broader issue of cybersecurity rather than just cybercrime and hacking. I think it's interesting to share maybe some of the issues that will be hopefully or probably be covered in our uh, panel tomorrow and maybe pose a question here to the table and to uh, the participants as well. Um, Karen, you were talking about uh, the, the translation of policy documents, uh, providing them in different languages, making them available, uh, strategies, uh, guidelines. But as the Internet developed from the grassroots level, we do the same at the national level, of course. And in the Netherlands, we're trying to make all our documents, strategies, etc., always available in English as well. So we can share them with all of our international partners. Um, one of the, or a few of the interesting examples could, for example, be that uh, where uh, we focus in our multi-stakeholder approach um, on an operational, a tactical, and a strategic level. Um, uh, examples are our National Cybersecurity uh, Center, which actually has liaisons from private companies in there, uh, academia as well. We have a Cybersecurity Council. Council. Uh, we have even private initiatives uh, on botnets, which uh, are connecting to our center or to our uh, policy level. Um, so all these co cooperation uh, methods and models uh, we make available for our international partners. Uh, we make case studies available. So we have the DigiNotar case, in which we experienced in 2011, and we're trying to engage with our partners both at technical but also at strategic level to really get that sea level uh, commitment and realization that this is uh, an issue uh, of, of, for all of us um, to get at, at the table and to, get to, to make people realize that. So I guess the question here would be how do we engage these national or sometimes more often bilateral initiatives, uh, best practices, how, is there a gap between the supply and demand side uh, for these, this kind of information sharing? And if so, how do we, uh, how can we better organize these uh, supply and demand, demand for such models, for such information? Thanks. All right. Thank you. Do any other panelists want to comment on the question? Uh, Karen. Thank you. Karen Mulberry with the Internet Society. I can tell you with what I am trying to collect that, that I am um, accepting donations. So if anyone has material, that is a best practice. That, that is a, a technical solution or a recommendation or just even a, a general um, guideline that might be useful to be shared with others. Please let me know because I, I'm, I've got a website that, that uh, we're, we have put together um, where I can host all these materials um, you know, with, with your branding. Um, I'm just saying we've got the, the MOG documents, we've got some London Action Plan documents, I have some GSMA documents, other things that have been contributed by other experts who have devised either articles on, on these are things that how it works or, or technical things um, and tools that, that one should pay attention to. So send them to me, and I will post them, and we will push them out through our chapters and, and through the work that we're doing right now so that hopefully the message will get out to a broader audience. Yeah, Chris? Uh, so there, there's a lot of good work that's being done in some of the regional organizations that I think can be shared. For instance, the Organization for American States has been doing a program with countries in that region uh, on national stra cyber uh, security strategies. And so I think that's that kind of thing is very helpful because so many countries are now building those strategies. And, uh, and you know, I, I also want to emphasize how important those strategies are as an organizing concept because it's not just one government agency. It's really a whole-of-government approach where there's uh, the economic agencies, the security agencies, the police are all involved in this. But it's also the civil society and, and, and the private sector. So understanding how those strategies can be built are important. The other is uh, building institutions like CERTs uh, and how do you do that as countries are facing that. And I think that's part and parcel of some of the capacity building efforts. And that's one of the way you, ways you get this into the hands of other people around the world is, is more of the targeted capacity building that helps them do things like do these national strategies, build the institutions they need, and build the capabilities. 
Yeah, just a quick comment. Um, uh, you had mentioned some of the botnet activities. Um, just an example of how um, there is some information sharing going, going on. I participated in a workshop last month at APEC um, that was specific about botnets, and there were, there were presenters, um, self-included, from lots of different countries talking about um, activities being done to mitigate botnets um, that I think um, uh, was very well done. And it was, there, was good, there was a good exchange of information about how different uh, countries are doing different programs um, to deal with botnets. I feel like that issue has... Um, has um, taken on some momentum of its, momentum of its own, and um, there's been a lot of activity to uh, kind of emulate the model of, of um, notifying end users who might be infected with botnets as part of kind of um, keeping the internet more healthy and clean. So. Um, any questions? Other? We have one question over here. Uh, I'm Brian Tan from Singapore. Um, I have a comment and maybe um, it could elicit some comments from um, the panel as well as from the floor. Uh, and I'm relating this to the previous discussion also on um, that we had on spam. Uh, and I do see a correlation between spam, personal data protection, and cybercrime. Uh, spam essentially says, don't send me stuff I don't want. Personal data says protect some of my stuff, and cybercrime says uh, don't commit uh, illegal activity uh, that might affect me. Um, the three do work hand in hand. Uh, they overlap, but they do not necessarily um, cover each other completely. Um, and so my comment would be uh, each one uh, does have its place. Uh, the interesting question, I think, from a development, a developing country point of view uh, is, as a matter of priority, um, which piece should come first if, you know, you had limited resources? Do you start off with the low base, the spam moving up to data protection and then to cybercrime, or do you start the other way, uh, the one with the greatest impact, cybercrime down to data protection, and then down to spam. Thank you very much. I think Giantha may have a comment on that one. Um, thank you. Well, it's a very interesting question, but uh, quite difficult to answer because there is no open and shut tailor-made mechanism uh, that a country can uh, follow or needs to follow. And every country may uh, follow different options and different routes to uh, legislative reform combined with cybercrime, cybersecurity cyber strategy. Uh, certainly from our perspective, well, the approach that I see many countries adopting uh, more increasingly uh, than uh, 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 more increasing in the recent times is to give preference or priority to legislative efforts or legislation uh, dealing with cybercrime and then follow through privacy, data protection uh, and, and in, of course even in that area you see different options and models. Some countries prefer to follow a legislative route uh, particularly those countries dealing with uh, European Union data transfer issues. And vis-a-vis -vis that, you have situations like in our country. Uh, we tend to look at the safe harbor model followed in the U.S. as well as the private sector code of practice. Since you are from Singapore, you are familiar with the model in Singapore, the private sector code of uh, practice for data and privacy protection. Uh, that uh, many countries like Sri Lanka prefer to uh, uh, adopt through uh, mechanisms for self-regulation, self-governance uh, in the area of uh, privacy and data protection. Uh, so there is no one route uh, that a particular country can take. Uh, countries can follow different routes. Uh, certainly uh, from my perspective, my perspective, what I have seen happening uh, is the other way around, namely giving preference to uh, cybercrime legislation going forward first, mainly due to the reason that 
countries feel the desire to deal with the problem as an immediate steps and to provide a mechanism for pre preventive steps to be taken and to empower the law enforcement and the judicial system to deal with uh, issue that they feel should be prioritized more than anything else. Thank you. Yes, I, th I believe Root has a comment. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I don't think it's up to me or anyone in the panel to say what a country should adopt or not, of course. What I can share with you is the training I've done two times now through the Internet Society that they asked me, can, could you explain to the, to the countries present how you dealt with the, the spam problem, the unsolicited commercial email in the Netherlands? And I said, yes, of course I could, because basically it's just one article. And if you allow me to say so, Mr. from Mexico, it says, thou shalt not spam, with some exceptions and, and, and nice legal words. But that's a very easy way to tackle a first step, perhaps. And then you have a few people dedicated to enforcing that, because, of course, except for that article, you need some enforcement tools that you give to the agency. But if these people get the experience to work with the law and find their way into researching the Internet, doing something with, with the right tools, with the forensic tools, then they get the experience to go onwards and more, do more difficult tasks. But if you also look at what happened in the Netherlands, basically, is that we found from day one all these cases that had to do with fraud or with others. We pretended often that it was just button pushing and went after these people anyway. Perhaps we lost those cases seven, eight years later in court, but the crime was stopped in 2004, 5, and 6. And so it was very effective against all sorts of fraud being committed in the Netherlands, even from abroad. Because we just stopped, for example, with SMS spam saying, congratulations, you won 500 euros, call this expensive telephone number. We just called the operator and said, do you want to be associated with fraud? And usually they said no, and a day later, the number was closed. So there was no enforcement, there was no forcing anything, just saying, do you want to be associated with this? And they wouldn't. So in other words, the Netherlands did not become attractive anymore to these sort of people, and we basically drove SMS fraud spam away from the Netherlands for years until a new guy came up, and he was stopped also. And then we could even find someone in the Netherlands. So in, in, in other words, you can be a, l a lot more effective than just spam messages. But they, you have to have a provision in your law to do so. You have to have the commitment of an organization. And we were only four people starting this. We were not just four people. And 85% went down, remember? So in other words, it can be very effective if you have this dedication from the government that says, I have a few people doing this, and they are allowed to do some training courses to know how to do this. And that's actually how you start changing things. And that's one option. The other one is to start in the top. But that's up to a country to decide. Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just, just a, a quick comment. You know, I, I know it's difficult um, uh, when you have limited resources, but I think this is not an area where you can necessarily follow a linear path where you say, well, first we'll do this and then we'll do that. I think you need to uh, pursue parallel paths. You have to have good laws in place, particularly good cybercrime laws, uh, because you could have very trained uh, personnel to fight some of these threats, and if they don't have that legal structure in place, then it doesn't matter. Uh, and the same thing, is you, if you have great laws in place but don't have the good uh, trained people to enforce those laws, uh, you're also not going to be effective. So you have to really look at all of these things together, and you have to look at both combating threats and strengthening uh, protections for networks, and that come, that's national strategies, that's building certs. So, um, there is a lot of uh, material out there because a lot of countries have gone through this for countries to use and best practices for them to learn from and capacity building opportunities for those countries, uh, particularly in the areas of building their legal structures and in building institutions like CERTs. 
and even for law enforcement training. But I think it's one of these things where you have to address it at multiple fronts at the same time and not say we'll do one thing and when we finish that we're going to start uh, engaging the next step of the process. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask if there's any um, remote uh, participation at the moment. Yes, yeah, so Mr. Gideon from Kenya wants to make a video call and wants to comment. Okay. I assume you know how to arrange for that. <laughs> I didn't know that was possible. Um, wait a moment, please. No problem. Um, can we um, can we take a few other questions while you're setting that up? Is that possible? Yes, uh, you can move on to the other participants. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Uh, it's, it's not a problem. Um, while you set it up, I would um, I will ask any other participants if they have any um, any uh, questions. Um, yes, um, gentleman back here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Quint. I'm, um, I'm the general manager for the Pacific CERT uh, based in Fiji. Uh, firstly, an observation or something that I think that uh, the panel might have taken for granted, but uh, which I think needs to be mentioned. And uh, that's the, we, we all seem to take for granted that these three issues, spam, so, um, hacking and uh, cybercrime, are important issues, uh, are big issues, but I think it's uh, it, it should be asked how big, how big exactly are these problems? What I'm what I'm getting at is that the importance of statistics. Uh, we need to be able to measure these problems, and not just measure them in the jurisdictions where they're uh, they're measured uh, correctly now. We need to focus on the jurisdictions where they're not being collected now, like my own uh, Pacific Island countries. There's no statistics for spam, for um, for cybercrime, for hacking in these jurisdictions, and we don't know how big that problem is, and I think that's something that we need to focus on first. And that leads into my second point in that uh, when we're talking about these issues, we're talking about security, we're talking about uh, the weakest link. You know, your security is only as good as the weakest link in that chain. And, uh, you know, emerging developing economies like in the Pacific, you know, we are, we are getting on the Internet now, faster Internet, uh, better connections, and there's a big chance, there's a big um, potential for our economies to become hubs for cybercrime, to become hubs for uh, spam because of the lack of expertise in our region. And... Um, <clears throat> I think that's something that uh, we all need to keep in the forefront of our minds is that you know, you, you, when we're dealing with these issues, you have to develop uh, or we have to deal with them on a global scale. You've got to look at uh, the smaller economies and help them to be as secure as the bigger economies because um, otherwise you're just going to drive uh, these criminal factors into our own jurisdictions and so they will start operating out of our countries. Um, the last thing I wanted to uh, to to some well to ask the panel was uh, I was glad to hear that um, two panelists had mentioned uh, associations with CERTs. Uh, we have um, Sri Lanka CERT and uh, there's the US CERT as well and uh, ID CERT. Enisa represented on the panel. Um, it, you know what I'm asking is uh, has has the panel dealt with certs in relation to these issues, what what are your impressions of uh, certs in relation to these issues, and what do you think, or what what role do you think that certs should play in dealing with these issues from a governance perspective? Thank you. Uh, 
Um, yes, uh, Jayantha, I believe, would like to respond. Uh, thank you. But uh, are we having the remote call in, Chris? So I was going to ask that question. Is the remote call ready? No. doesn't appear to be. So why don't you go ahead and go, and then uh, okay. we'll go circle back. <coughs> yeah. Um, so thank you very much for the question from the gentleman from Fiji. Uh, well, um, I completely agree. Uh, all of the issues you mentioned are relevant, and there's an importance for uh, countries and uh, organizations in those countries to work together to set up proper technical coordination to support uh, law enforcement and policy makers. Uh, that is uh, very, very important. <coughs> You asked the question about certs. Uh, I believe each of the panel members here are uh, passionate about it, and they speak with one voice that uh, the role of the cert, both from a country perspective, from a regional perspective, and from a global perspective, is extremely important to deal either with spam, and malware issues connected with spam or whatever, to cybercrime enforcement issues, or any other issues associated with <coughs> broader cybersecurity uh, and other areas that uh, many of the panelists dealt with. From our own experience, we see that uh, CERT <coughs> by itself in a country cannot work effectively unless they are part of a regional community. So in the Asia-Pacific region, we are fortunate that uh, with a lot of help from JP-CERT and uh, OSCERT, that the Asia-Pacific CERT, AP-CERT, has taken a lead, uh, leapfrog initiative to support coordination in the Asia-Pacific region. And <clears throat> Sri Lanka CERT became a full member of AP-CERT uh, about four years back and uh, qualified a uh, year before last to host the uh, cyber security drill for AP CERT. So uh, regional certs are very important, but that by itself is not, not, not enough. There is a need for global coordination, and that is where uh, often we don't hear them uh, uh, very much spoken of in this fora, but the Forum for Incidence Response Teams, first, is a very important organization from a global perspective. And uh, we increasingly urge countries that have established certs to become full members of FIRST in order to effectively collaborate from a global perspective. And that is all I need to add for the time being. Thank you. Yes. Um, any other uh, comments on measurements and uh, awareness raising? Uh, Karen yeah. Aubrey, uh, uh, Karen, what, I'm sorry. Uh, why don't you go ahead and go? And then we, I think we do actually have a written down oh, copy of the okay. remote question. So um, can we ask that, that question and then to kind of come back to this particular topic? So Mr. Gillian, he commented that on the international cross-border ratifications and conventions, they should be made as a harmonization of existing built-in cyber law. This ensures that all countries are in clear understanding of the proposed legislations to prevent a situation where laws are met on a continental or international level, and yet the individual nations don't understand it. We also have one comment from Mr. Faisal Hassan. Uh, he asks, if, is there any initiative to bridge the cybersecurity initiatives between the U.S. and the European or Commonwealth and with the developing countries? Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris. Yeah, well, let me let me start with uh, the last the, the live question that was asked, and then go back. So on, uh, uh, well, actually, Karen was going to answer that. So let me pass to. 
Yeah, Karen was going to go first, and this is this is done the measurements and uh, yeah. Yeah, awareness. So, yeah. I'm just going to respond to you, to the first question that that was asked some time ago, uh, in in the fact that as part of the program that I have been, I have put together, I do have a company that that has offered to do um, free analytics for developing countries. So if you want to get a better handle of what's going on in your network and the traffic and what your issues might be, um, come see me, and I, I will. Um, provide you the information and, and the instructions for getting a handle on, on the analytics, and hopefully that will assist you. Uh, this is uh, Chris Painter. Um, statistic, you know, first on the statistics issue, I think that's a challenge for all of us, frankly. It's very hard sometimes to measure the cost of cybercrime, and we get very uh, various different uh, results. But I agree with you that it's important to have that statistical basis to see what the scope of the problem is. We all know that the problem is large, but it helps drive policy as well. Uh, on, um, on the issue of the weakest link and countries who are now getting connectivity dealing with these issues, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, but it also presents not just a, th a threat, uh, but an opportunity. And I think the opportunity is that countries who are now getting greater connectivity, who are getting cable drops, et cetera, uh, can now respond and put policies in place from the beginning, rather than uh, the U.S. and many others who have had to add policies after the fact. We, we had the technology, we saw all of the various issues it created, and then we started uh, adopting policies. Now I think you're in a position to have the institutions, have the strategies, have the, uh, the cybercrime law in place, uh, and really deal with these issues head on, knowing what, what's coming. And I think that pre presents a real opportunity, uh, but that also means uh, that you need to have the uh, tools to deal with that, and that's where capacity building comes in again. And on the role of certs, uh, you're right. All of us here have said this is a critical element, and I totally agree that regional organizations play an important role in that as well. And I'd say that uh, one of the key things in a national strategy is having a national-level cert and cooperating with other certs around the world. And how often do we deal with certs? Uh, even though I'm at the State Department and I have more of a policy role, I, I deal with the folks in our U.S. CERT and our Department of Homeland Security literally every day, and it really is important to have the different parts of your government working together, including the, the technical community and the law enforcement and the policy community. Uh, on, on the questions that, that came in over the, the I guess, the phone, um, we do believe that uh, the Budapest Convention I mentioned in cyber crime laws provides uh, an important model, and really the only model out there, that countries should uh, either accede to that and get the benefits of that uh, convention or at least model their laws after it. And that provides a consistency around the world. It addresses some of the weakest link issues and allows much better cooperation on cybercrime. Um, you know, I think the idea, and there's been sometimes floated the idea of doing a new global convention. Uh, I honestly think that would take about 10 years to accomplish and you'd end up with something that is not as strong uh, as that Budapest Convention is now. So I do think this is something where many more countries are adopting it, many more countries are modeling their laws after it, and that's important. And then as far as uh, U.S. and European <laughs> uh, cybersecurity strategies and how that could be uh, uh, shared with the rest of the world, that's, that goes back exactly to this idea of capacity building uh, and getting the message out. Uh, you can learn... You know, we, we've made, uh, uh, we made, I think, a lot of good progress. We've also made some mistakes along the way. You can learn from both of those things. And I think that we can share that information and, indeed, our, our intent on doing that through capacity building. Uh, one last point in terms of the opportunities, a good example of this is Kenya. We did a capacity building uh, uh, seminar with uh, the government of Kenya, co-sponsored it for the East, uh, East African countries. And uh, with that... We talked about cybercrime, we talked about uh, building legal structures, we talked about cybersecurity, we talked about uh, working with the private sector and other stakeholders. Uh, and what was really amazing is Kenya has some, uh, they recently gotten a lot of connectivity through uh, a cable drops there. And they've developed some tools like M-Pesa, an online payment system, that in many ways is more advanced than systems that I have uh, access to in the United States. So uh, you have this innovation happening in the developing world. And uh, for that innovation to really succeed, having good cybersecurity policies in place and cybercrime policies in place is important. So we have to link those together. Just, I'd like to make a 
Make a quick comment um, as an industry participant here on the panel that certs are also very important from an industry perspective in that, uh, like, for example, in particular in the United States, uh, U.S. cert is, also, is, uh, is really part of an entity called the, uh, the National Center uh, for Cybersecurity Integration or the INCIC. Um, which um, there are companies such as mine that literally um, um, have people in the room uh, with a 24 by 7 operational capability to try to deal with some of these cyber attacks as they arise. So I think, you know, when we talk about cybersecurity, uh, one of the issues that we'd like to talk about is public-private partnerships. And I think uh, the partnership between some of the industry certs and U.S. cert and working with entities like the INCIC within the United States is something that's um, something that will hopefully continue to grow and give us a better um, a response capability. So um, when you ask the question about the roles of certs, I think it's also important from an industry perspective as well. Yes. Uh, yes. I think the uh, Svaltonatris, I think was a good example is that, that as a London Action Plan member, then still in enforcement, I actually went to first, when we got an invitation to present, we actually presented there on the London Action Plan of the way we fight spam, etc. And we got very good responses from that from that uh, presentation. I think what's another good example is that with the National uh, Cybersecurity Center, which uh, the Dutch GovCert is now a part of, what actually happened is is that when there's a crisis there, then actually teams are formed around that crisis, and that bring in different sort of law enforcement agencies, those of in industry and government, to deal with the crisis together. So I think that that is a, a possible model to go forward and bring the right expertise into a crisis situation in, in, in a country when, for example, the telecommunications uh, business gets hacked or something like that. Um, also with, with CERS, I think was a good example of what is happening in Europe at this moment. There's an initiative called Advanced Cyber Defense Center, which is a 50% EU-funded project and 50% industry-funded. There's a consortium being, it has been built, which has very different partners within it. So ranging from national search to, to industry, to law enforcement, to governments, and all trying to tackle the botnet problem together and mitigate it. And it has two different pillars. One is it's going to set up national support centers like Germany has at this moment uh, called Botfrei, Botfree, in which end users are being helped through a website and a back office to clean their PCs or devices once it is infected with, with malware. The other thing is a little bit more revolutionary is that there's going to be a central database in which everybody who wants to share data on botnets or on malicious traffic can put that data into the database where it gets analyzed, enriched, and, and mixed with all sort of other known data. So actually the, the patterns behind a botnet is going to be it's going to become clear. And that means that you may be also be able to do something about the people that are running the botnets or hosting the botnets or making use of the botnets. So in that, in that way, you can perhaps over time push the problem back into to less the dramatic proportions and that DDoS attacks may over time become less effective. So maybe they will even go away, hopefully, over time. If anyone is interested in this project in ACDC, as we call it, please come up and talk to me after uh, after the meeting. Yeah, th just to elaborate, I think what Rudy is mentioning is that in many countries now, um, there has been an um, effort to um, address botnets through notifying end users who may be infected and uh, providing them with information about how to potentially remediate their uh, machine. Um, I believe that those types of initiatives have started around the world. Um, I know that there's the Australian code that's there. Um, I know that it's happened in Japan, uh, Echo in Germany, and in the United States there's uh, ABCs for ISPs that were developed, um, which um, um, a lot of ISPs are following to notify their customers. And I think the in, um, there's also efforts underway to uh, measure uh, the state of botnets through uh, metrics and other types of things. MOG has a metrics initiative underway as we speak. So, Chris. Uh, just on that botnet issue, one thing that we've been trying to promote um, around the world, and in response, quite frankly, to some uh, uh, botnet uh, and denial of service attacks on our financial uh, institutions over the past year, uh, is much greater international cooperation in fighting this threat. 
Uh, and what it's meant is we've reached out both through our U.S. CERT uh, to uh, their counterparts around the world, where there are counterparts, and some places there are not, so this is the importance of having these kinds of institutions in your government. Uh, but also, interestingly, through diplomatic channels to say, you know, this is not just a technical request you're getting through your technical authorities. This really is important to us. This is something where we really do need your help to combat a threat, just like any other threat that's out there. And to be receptive that if a country makes a request of us to fight that same kind of threat, that we're going to be responsive to them as well. And to build that norm, if you will, of greater international collaboration. Now, not every country has the institutions in place to be able to, to do that effectively, and that's part of the capacity building. But I think uh, these kinds of collaboration against external threats like botnets are a real critical way of going forward. Yeah, I completely agree. I think that's a critically important issue. And I think even on the industry side, there's efforts underway to try to create a little bit of mutual self-aid by um, establishing those relationships um, internationally amongst the, uh, some of the major ISPs as well. So, Woot, do you have any, anything to add? Uh, just reminded of another comment. Um, coming back to the gentleman from Fiji on, on how actually to, to, to assist countries and developing countries with the problem, there is a lot of knowledge out there and tools out there that Western companies at this moment are using, whether it's for, through filtering or other best practices that they actually use. Is there a way to, to assist those companies in developing, in, in developing countries with getting access to these sort of tools so that you can actually implement them before the trouble really arises? Because that's probably one of the best way to defend a, a, a a, a new economy from all the harm that is being done here because we have implemented it years after the fact and I don't know if it's a financial or a technical uh, problem but it's something that may be worthwhile looking into and see if it's possible to do something about the problem from that angle. Yeah, I don't know if Karen wants to comment on that but that really I think that ties back into the capacity building side of things. Thank you, Karen Mulberry, the Inter Internet Society. Actually, that's part of what, what our project is all about, right. is actually bringing together parties that, that have uh, expertise um, in analytics and in many different uh, fields and forms into areas where they can work with um, providers, um, networks, uh, governments, and on um, understanding all of the components that are out there and the tools and you know, as I, I mentioned uh, I mean I've got one company that will do the analytics for a network operator to give you a better sense of your traffic and when where in essence malicious emails may be coming from um, and what language they may be coming from to give you a better understanding of how you want might want to approach management on your network so there are a lot of um, uh, vendors and, and experts willing to assist and, and what we're trying to do is facilitate getting them in front of the developing countries that have the need so they can share. Okay. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, we have about 45 minutes left. Um, and, and just a quick comment, uh, I'd like to talk briefly about cybercrime and then we have um, about eight questions that were uh, teed up by the stakeholders that I'd like to walk through as well to close the session. So let's quickly take a few more questions from the audience and then we will touch on cybercrime and then at uh, promptly at 5 o'clock we'll wrap up with the last 30 minutes addressing the, uh, the questions from the um, stakeholder groups. So any audience questions? Yes. Um, thank you. My name is Tiarma. I'm from uh, Indonesia. I'm a postgraduate student for defense management. Um, as much as we gaining uh, and benefited um, from the internet, like we promote democracy, human rights, um, equality, as much as terrorism movement. Um, by the way, I'm studying terrorism. I mean, I'm studying on terrorism object. Um, they also gaining benefit uh, to propag you know propaganda on their um, uh, narrative um, instructor. Um, capacity building and also operating uh, military operation. Um, in Indonesia, we have established a sort of like a counterterrorism, and I understand there is an internet uh, analysis uh, integrated to this counterterrorism. Um, but 
my question is actually, um, what is your? I need. I want to uh, know. I would like to know your perspective on um, what is the effective way, uh, in a way, in integrated this internet instrument into counterterrorism, uh, probably based on your uh, respective country experience. Thank you. Anyone want to take that question? Mm, I don't think it uh, doesn't look like it. Um, so um, maybe we'll have to uh, talk offline about that. I don't think we have anybody up here that has the expertise in that area. I mean, the, the only thing I'd say is that there's two different aspects here. There's terrorists using the Internet to uh, recruit, proselytize, plan, et cetera. And there's the concern of terrorists, just like other threat actors, uh, at attacking critical national infrastructures on the Internet. And they're two different issues. Uh, the latter is something that we're worried about, but we really haven't seen, but we need to be prepared for. And that's the same kind of uh, 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 steps we take to protect our national infrastructures, prioritize them, uh, have good uh, responses in place for that. In terms of uh, terrorists using the Internet, just like other uh, criminals that are out there are doing it, uh, you know, I think that there, you know, we, we need to be aware of that. We need to take um, uh, uh, appropriate actions to deal with that. Uh, and, uh, you know, for instance, there is uh, some laws in the U.S. about um, uh, uh, promoting not, uh, of actual material support for terrorism, and, and there's been some enforcement around that issue. So there's a variety of different ways the Internet is used and a variety of different responses we have to adopt. It appears that we may have another remote. Uh, one second on the remote question, and the, the chairman would like to speak as well. Um, we have a question from Mr. Robert Lubanga from Uganda. Oh, no, it's a comment. The one question we need to ask ourselves is, are the strategies we have been using in developed countries to tighten cybersecurity work where have we failed? Maybe the developing countries can copy from this. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for the comment. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, would you like to speak? Yeah. I would like to speak in Indonesia. Please translate uh, for the translator. Uh, the main word for terrorism there are two things. Firstly, the belief of something that creates another thing and being regardless, there are words that are offensive, for example. For the this type of distribution, if there are illegal content in the related cybercrime itself, then you can bring this to court. Cybercrime, first additional protocol, racist and xenophobic. Untuk Indonesia, for Indonesia, for in working properly for that. Tapi untuk kriteria yang kedua. But for the second criteria, we are still unable to protect all the infrastructures itself from the threats of terrorism. If you think it's an effort to crack down our infrastructure. So we go back to whether cybercrime that is within a law of a certain country has reached to the illegal content and the interference of the system itself. Thank you. Okay. All right, I'd like to um, now quickly shift to um, cybercrime and ask each of the panelists to uh, comment there, and I think the main uh, topic is around, you know, what um, what are some ways to strengthen uh, law enforcement cooperation, uh, particularly internationally, in dealing with cybercrime. Um, so I don't know who wants to go first. Um, do you want to go first? Uh, going to go first. Uh, Chris, uh, is there a specific question that is required to be answered, or? Um, I think it's really just around um, what what should be done to enhance efforts to deal with cybercrime. Right. Uh, well, uh, uh, dealing with cybercrime, uh, we need to have proper legislative 
uh, and enforcement mechanisms in place. That's the first thing. But having a statutory legal framework by itself in, your, in, in a particular country will not be sufficient if it is done in a manner where it is not compatible with global practices and norms that ensures greater collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation uh, for law enforcement agency, agencies to collaborate. This is where when countries adopt legislative measures, they must, they can look at options, they can look at available models, but they have to put in place statutory uh, uh, features that ensures harmonization and uh, uh, <coughs> best practice uh, tools that are available globally. So in Sri Lankan experience, what I can say is that when the ICT development strategy was adopted about 10 years ago, and with all of the technology-based, innovation-based activities coming into the market, we had a, a string of or a burst of activities around uh, criminal behavior uh, using Internet as a tool to hack into our systems, and there were certain vulnerabilities de detected. <coughs> Sorry. To address this phenomenon, we looked at options available, and of course Sri Lanka being part of the British Commonwealth, we looked at the Commonwealth model law as a model law template or a tool that we could use. We looked at the UK Computer Misuse Act, and we adopted features of both in our national legislation and included provisions that are known as the Harare Convention for Mutual Assistance and Legal Cooperation that is applicable to countries which were part of the British Commonwealth. However, <coughs> we found that that in itself was not sufficient because we had to engage in cooperation with United States, Japan and European countries that were not part of the British Commonwealth. So when we looked at legis legislative options, we found that the Budapest Convention was the best available template or the tool in terms of legislative norms, not only for its substantive law elements that we were able to use, but in terms of the checks and balances that are necessary for investigation and prosecution of cybercrime related offenses, we found the Budapest Convention was the best way forward. So what was done was to use uh, the Budapest Cybercrime Convention as the model for our legislative uh, formulation of uh, the statute called the Computer Crimes Act that was passed through Parliament in 2007. And that in turn led to a series of other activities associated with capacity building, uh, empowering the law enforcement with, with digital forensic tools, etc., etc. But from a global perspective, what is important for a country to realize is that, as I said earlier, cybercrime cannot be dealt with one country alone. It has to be done in collaboration with multiple countries and with multiple law enforcement agencies sitting in different forms of legal traditions. We have the common law tradition and sometimes we have to deal with countries having the civil law tradition. So the Budapest Convention there again is the best practice available because across legal traditions, whether it's civil law tradition or common law tradition, you have one single uh, treaty that allows for uh, law enforcement cooperation, judicial cooperation to deal with cybercrime. And in terms of capacity building, one last point, if I may, uh, Chris, add to the point of capacity building. We found that putting in place a statutory framework by itself was not sufficient. Uh, law enforcement and the judges had to be educated. Uh, and there again, we did not have the resources to do that by ourselves. 
So we reached out to the Council of Europe and just the week before last, uh, we hosted a very effective uh, uh, law enforcement uh, judicial training program in conjunction with Council of Europe in Colombo, Sri Lanka, where over 100 participants covering the judiciary, law enforcement, and the private sector uh, took part. And uh, there was a lot of collaborative efforts put in that connection. And what I want to finally highlight is that the Council of Europe has put out a very useful uh, tool called the Electronic Evidence Guide that provides for a regime that can be adopted in any given country in gathering of forensic evidence and presenting them before courts of law. So these tools and best practices and access to these best practices was an uh, end result of engaging uh, in a collaborative exercise with the Council of Europe. So with that, I will close for the moment, but I will be happy to answer uh, uh, any question, uh, questions connected with uh, the need for harmonization and to effectively deal with law enforcement cooperation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Any other comments from the panelists? Uh, Woot, you want to go first? Yes? Sabal Um As I said, I'm representing the London Action Plan now, and when you heard my comment, you know I put that cap down and put my own one on uh, at this moment, so I'm speaking in a private capacity. But last year I was able to do a comparative study in, uh, in Europe, sponsored by uh, one of the, the, the bigger uh, companies in the world. Um, what we actually did is we approached organizations in Europe that we knew were somehow working on cybersecurity from e either a security point of view or from a legislative point of view. And we asked them several questions. And what the main conclusion basically was is that we need to break down silos, silos at the national level and silos at the international level. Because these organizations said it's so hard to even cooperate together because whether it's from a privacy point of view, it's from a financial point of view, or because we can't speak technically to each other, it's almost impossible to share information and data, and specifically privacy-sensitive data. So how do you go about solving problems like cybersecurity if you can't tell what is actually going on with whom and where? Um, that is international level, because people, organizations do not find each other, they don't know who they are, but, and that's at the international level even worse, because then you don't know at all who to address unless you're in the same community together. So what, I, what actually happened is that th these organizations also stated, but it's not in my remit to change this. And that's when I come back to the London Action Plan, where we discuss this sort of thing very often, but everybody concluded is not for me as an independent regulator often to discuss this with my government because I've been given a specific task and it's not there to criticize my government that I can't do my job in the right way. So in other words, these organizations just do their job and it's not their job to break down silos or find new paths or do massive international relations work or coordination work if that's not in their remit. So in other words, if that is not looked at, things will never change. And then we come back to the role of a government that it may be time to, to reevaluate the new world where we are. Because this is a new world that without barriers, the criminals don't have any boundaries, borders, legal, whatever. They just go over a fiber optic wherever they want to go. And of course, in the end, the crime is always being done at somebody's doorstep. But the, the trick is to find out whose doorstep that is. And as a last comment, I will go into a court case that my former employer lost in the highest court possible this spring. It was on a malware case where a Dutch company that was selling advertisements, online advertisements, had a lot of people working for them to infect computers around the world. And these guys were very effective because they were number seven of the world in 2006. There's about 23 million computers all around the world at their disposal. What we did, were able to do to shut down the 
the organization itself, but then we started investigating and they had 1,770 something what they call affiliates, people who infect computers. Some were effective, some weren't, but of those 1,770 something, only three were in the Netherlands. Of two were moderately successful and one wasn't effect effective at all. The other 770 something were abroad. So in other words, there's nothing a Dutch legislator could do about it, and you don't, how do you reach people in Colombia, in Venezuela, in Russia, who were doing the actual infections? Then the guys who commissioned the infection were acquitted of that in, in, in court, because the attribution rule in the law was not written in the correct way. So in other words, they were not responsible for their deeds according to Dutch law. The second one, the Dutch judge said, yes, after that, the computers were shown commercial things and spammed, but they were sent abroad, so the violation was abroad. So there's nothing you, Dutch regulator, are allowed to do about that because the violation is somewhere else. And now the strange things happen that we already knew that if somebody sent spam to us, to the Netherlands, from around the world, we would never have jurisdiction because the button is pushed somewhere else. So now we have the strange contradiction that when the button is pushed in the Netherlands but it goes out of the country, the regulator is no longer allowed to deal with it. But the other way around, when it gets on my computer and affects my computer or spam is shown on my computer, it's also not allowed to do something because the button is pushed somewhere else. So in other words, if governments don't start dealing with this sort of angles of the problem, then we're lost, because then we can only do something when a guy pushes a button and infects a Dutch computer or sends a message to a Dutch end user, and there are not so many of them around anymore. So here is the major challenge. How do we take down borders and help these organizations actually be able to do their jobs next to finding the, the right sort of laws in countries that don't have it yet? That's another beep in my word. I didn't say that myself, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> Chris, do you want to comment? Uh, well, I, I think that um, a couple of things. One, uh, this is really the other side of the coin from the cybersecurity thing. They really go together. One is making sure that you uh, take all the precautions you can and build all the defenses you can to protect your networks, uh, but you also have to have consequences for the people who break into them so if or use them for illegal purposes, fraud, etc., uh, so if you have the best uh, security, some people will still get in the network, still create, uh, still uh, cause criminal misconduct, and if there's no uh, consequences for them, they'll keep coming and the threats will get worse. Uh, and if you only have good enforcement but no cybersecurity, then uh, it's also not a complete solution. So they go hand in glove. I, I will say I've seen a real advance over the time I've been doing this over over the last uh, 20 years and certainly over the last five years too. <laughs> There are three, I think, uh, elements of this. One is having good legal structures in place. You may remember years ago with the I love you virus where they traced the person uh, you know, to a country and that country did not have any laws that punished that kind of conduct. And there was another example where someone broke into the court system of another country and uh, took information, but they said, well, that's not, tang that's not property. Uh, it's just information, so that wasn't a crime there. And a lot of countries now have modernized their laws. Uh, either, uh, as we've said, our, our um, strong preference, uh, and I think many countries are, is to adopt the Buddha, become a member, to ratify and become a member of the Budapest Convention, but if not, to actually emulate its provisions, uh, because that provides a really good framework. So having that legal structure in place is one uh, pillar. The second pillar is having uh, trained enforcement authorities, and, and that's something that you know, does require effort in countries to make sure that people have the technical training and the ability to work and, and also are working with the private sector and others in their, in their, uh, in their countries. And the third is how you deal uh, with cooperation internationally. And there, uh, I mentioned this 24-7 network before. Interpol is doing a lot of work. In fact, they're uh, they're establishing an Interpol center in uh, Singapore next year, for instance. Uh, so there's been work around that. And there's been a lot more international collaboration and cooperation on those threats because these are transporter threats. Almost every cybercrime does not 
uh, located within one particular country. So I think all of those efforts need to be uh, continually uh, um, uh, promoted. Uh, countries need to join on those, I think. Uh, and I go back again to developing world countries, too, because I think that it's critical that they have those legal structures, that those trained officers in place, and uh, work with the rest of the international community in collaborating against these threats. So I think those are all critical elements going forward. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, I believe the Mr. Chairman has a comment. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think if we would like to determine to determine in the ubiquitous uh, territory like internet, we would uh, refer to the characteristic of the formulation of the sentence itself. In Indonesia, we call this the leak. If this is a formal offense, it means if the activities had been done, no matter the, 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 the result had already uh, finished or yet, uh, result the created or yet at the, at the victim, since the beginning after they finishing their bad activities, the, 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 the criminal would be applied. So in this context, since the beginning, we had already uh, imagined that everyone go to internet have a motivation go globally. So in multiple jurisdictions, every country will have right to to put uh, to uh, to Im to Im implementing their jurisdiction. If they don't have extraterritorial jurisdiction it might be a big problem. But if every country have their own uh, article saying that extraterritorial jurisdiction, we can uh, uh, consider to what extent the dual criminality in each country had formalized in their sentences in the legal provisions. I think uh, the, the, the people had already known uh, about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we are down to about the last 20 minutes. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, is go through. Uh, I'm sorry. Do we have a question? Yeah. No. Yeah. I don't think we have any more time. So um, what I'm going to do is do a quick uh, wrap up of some of the takeaways I have from the session this afternoon, and I'd like to ask each of the panelists to maybe comment if they have um, any. Uh, 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 final comments that they'd like to offer um, to, to close here. So um, what I heard throughout the discussion was, um, uh, yes, yeah, so w before I begin, there was a series of questions that were provided uh, prior to the session from the stakeholders of the IGF. Um, uh, in looking through them, I believe we've addressed um, just about all of the questions. Um, if anyone, uh, if, if folks have has not seen them, they are available through the website. Um, if there are, but if you have additional questions or feel like these, these were not adequately addressed, um, please let me know. Um, most of the questions deal with areas around that we've, that we've touched on, including the Budapest Convention, uh, the role of the IGF in, um, in helping uh, sustain countries that are uh, less equipped to deal with various cybersecurity issues, um, the territoriality of fighting things like spam, hacks, botnets, and cybercrime. Um, the role of law enforcement, um, and then uniform laws on cybercrime, and the legal mechanisms to support internet governance and multi-stakeholder structures. I think we've touched on most of those topics throughout the conversation this afternoon, but if folks have additional questions they would like to raise, um, um, I would like to ask that um, and as the final um, part of this session. The, the main takeaways I had um, were there seems to be a consistent theme in dealing with both spam hacking and cybercrime around capacity building, uh, in particular in developing countries, um, sharing um, um, some of the uh, practices that are already available today and, and, and how to make some of that scalable um, on an international basis. Uh, Karen talked extensively about the uh, programs that ISOC uh, has initiated um, to help with that effort, but there, uh, there seems to be uh, a general theme there around general capacity building. Uh, another theme I had was um, uh, there's a need for international and regional cooperation, um, in, even at the operational level through the role of some of the certs and other uh, capabilities. And then from a cybercrime perspective, the need for legal frameworks and just general harmonization around 
around um, some of the different uh, uh, cyber crime laws um, and general discussion of the Budapest Convention. So those are some of the things that I took from the panel discussion. Um, but I'd like to ask each of the panels if they have any uh, closing remarks. Okay, uh, Chris, go first. Sure. I mean, I, I think this is a very, very useful discussion, and, and as not surprising, all three of these topics were interrelated, uh, and they are interrelated. And I think it's important that we think about uh, how, you know, how we can make sure that the things that are being done around the world, and things uh, like the Budapest Convention, like the capacity building efforts, like the best practices that are out there, uh, like the work of MOG, et cetera, are known. Uh, throughout the international community. I think that the IGF can play an important role in, in highlighting some of those efforts and calling countries' attention to it. Uh, there were a couple of questions in the, those uh, questions we got, uh, Chris, that I, I thought were interesting and perhaps we didn't completely address them. One of them was how can we achieve uh, uh, both uh, security uh, and openness? And, and I think that's an important one. And I, what I'd say is, uh, Cybersecurity is critically important, but we we have to do that at the same time as securing the openness of this uh, of this platform, because the openness of the internet is what drives the economic innovation and growth and social growth. Uh, and so, in the U.S., when we did an international strategy for cyberspace, we explicitly said we wanted an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable information communications infrastructure, both in the U.S. and around the world. And we had to have all of those things. We don't need to make uh, one over the other. We can't use security in a way that, that impinges on openness, but we have to have both because security makes openness possible. Uh, the other question I think we didn't really address is someone said they don't see that many uh, people from, for instance, the law enforcement community here, and I think that's an interesting point. I think it's rarely valuable at forums like this and at the next IGF to have as many different uh, stakeholders uh, here uh, not just uh, stakeholders uh, in terms of the three communities of civil or four civil society, technical community, uh, governments, and and uh, industry, but also within those different communities have a good variety. And even for governments, having both law enforcement and policy people and people involved in other areas, I think that's critically important. And I'd encourage that. So with that, thank you for uh, this discussion and thank you for the questions. Um, Giantha, thank you, Chris. Uh, so once again, uh, this has been a very interesting uh, and a rather lengthy panel discussion, I must say, even without a break. And I must thank the audience for being with us, because I thought we will be the only ones ending up here by this time. Uh, well, uh, I have a couple of uh, points I just want to uh, make in conclusion. Um, I agree with Chris that all these three topics are connected with each other, and there is a, 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 a there is a role for governments, the private sector, uh, civil society, and all of the community that we are part of, in all of the elements that we discussed this afternoon, and that is a key message I want to give. Secondly, when countries adopt cybercrime, cybersecurity strategies, uh, they must remember that they, <clears throat> they, can, they cannot address it in isolation. They have to do so in a collaborative manner and, and in engaging in collaboration, they must look at options that are best uh, in terms of global uh, uh, coordination harmonization, and effective judicial and law enforcement collaboration. <clears throat> Thirdly, uh, countries dealing with cybersecurity, cybercrime issues uh, should work with regional groups, sub-regional groups, etc. So I believe uh, uh, Mr. Mark Carvel from the UK government is seated uh, right next to me. Uh, he's heading a Commonwealth IGF uh, a discussion, I believe, on Friday that will look at some of these issues uh, in relation to countries which are part of the British Commonwealth. Sri Lanka is part of the uh, countries that were part of the uh, 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 earlier British rule. So there are 53 countries roughly within the Commonwealth. And that regional group has done an enormous amount of work in the area of cybersecurity and even helping countries to formulate 
cybercrime legislation through a initiative known as the Cyber Commonwealth Cybercrime Initiative. So there's a need for countries to work together in collaboration with uh, regional groups, uh, sub-regional groups, and uh, whatever group that they can work with uh, to better harmonize, uh, uh, to ensure uh, global cooperation uh, in the effective fight against cybercrime. Then uh, one of my fi final messages would be that in putting structures to support law enforcement to deal with all of these issues in a country. Uh, law enforcement themselves cannot do it. They have to depend a lot on the network service providers, etc. And they have to be regularly updated with the new technologies and the novel methods of dealing with cybercrime incidents uh, and so on and so forth. To do that, there is a need for private sector collaboration. Uh, there's a need to work in conjunction with international organizations uh, such as the Council of Europe or, uh, you know, a Asia Pacific CERT or a FIRST or whatever uh, European organization. So w a country should remember that they should not be working in isolation with a small group of people to put structures in place. They have to look out for best practices that might suit their own territory. Uh, Sri Lanka, certainly speaking from my own experience, having uh, 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 looked at all of these options, we have benefited significantly. Uh, uh, Chris Painter mentioned uh, sometime earlier that uh, Kenya adopted a mobile payment system. Sri Lanka did the same in August last year. We became the first in South Asia to issue a mo mobile payment license to uh, international uh, player who started operations in the country. And one of the reasons why that happened was because we satisfied the best practice rules in the area of effective uh, uh, management of cybersecurity incidents responses, as well as legislative mechanisms to deal with cybercrime offenses. So there's a lot of benefit the country will have if we adopt global best practices. So that is what I need to mention in conclusion. Thank you very much. Th thank you. Any other uh, comments from the panelists? Uh, Karen? Yes, thank you. Karen Mulberry, the Internet Society. I just wanted to thank everyone for allowing me to have the opportunity to explain you, to you about our spam initiative, and, and I look forward to working with everyone in the um, uh, that has participated in this, in this discussion and, and growing this and, and hopefully um, having it in, as an enabler to encourage a lot of international collaboration as well as pulling the multi-stakeholder community together to work on this initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And I'd like to propose that as part of the uh, final report that we actually include um, some of the examples that you mentioned today, including some of the MOG, uh, practices, the London Action Plan, uh, we can attach them um, to the report for this session, unless there's anyone who objects. Hmm? Um, this is maybe a bit of a wild idea, but they're at an IGF, we're in a specific region each year, that's one. There are most excellent minds present with a lot of knowledge, so is there a possibility to for example, kick off the IGF on Sunday or Monday with specific trainings. There are a lot of people here that want to know things, and in a panel of one and a half hour, there's a lot of knowledge shared, but it's not training, it's not hands-on something. So that is that an, an option to look into if that's actually uh, possible to do in the future, because then people go home with, with something else than just talks. Uh, perhaps that's a recommendation that we could put in the uh, report for the IGF stakeholders as an output from this session, since one of the main themes was uh, capacity building throughout the throughout the conversation today. Okay, so that and the uh, attachment of some of the examples uh, that Karen discussed will be two of the uh, outputs from the session. All right. Um, with that, I think this session is closed. Um, thank you very much for participating. Uh, we appreciate all the questions from the audience. Oh, he has to close it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Miss, if the chairman has any remarks. 
Yeah, the chairman would like to make a final closing comment. Sorry. Uh, I just want to make only one paragraph to saying about our discussions. Uh, based on the pers uh, qualitative perspective, I found that uh, it was undisputed there is strong correlation between spamming and uh, cybercrime. And uh, it depends on the motivation. If only promotion, it might be legal in a uh, uh, legitimate interest. But if the motivation is bad to make uh, the, the consumers become unpleasant or destroying the or make the system not working properly, it would be classified as cybercrime. To handle cybercrime cases, maybe uh, might be it would, it would be better if the, in the future we would, we will talk about a transfer of proceeding of the cases, because in the multiple jurisdictions in the UB code territory, I believe transfer of proceedings may be uh, one of the uh, solving for all of the countries that have a power to to implement their cybercrime legislation. Thank you. And if it, well, okay. uh, I'm, I'll give Mr. Kumar also a chance to comment. Not closing the marks more uh, from an organization point of view. Some of the issues touched upon, and in particular, the very last question we received from the stakeholders, which is about a reasonable balance between a nation's interest in protecting the security of its citizens and the citizens' rights to privacy, freedom of expressions, access to information, freedom of association, will be dealt with more in depth on next Friday. Uh, under it, this coming Friday, under uh, emerging issues, we will deal with government surveillance, and the session is not as indicated in the written program, only one and a half hour, but we have extended it to the full three hours as we think it is of great interest to most participants. So if you want to always have the latest version of the program, please consult the IGF website. And this is just a notice for the session on surveillance on Friday morning between 9.30 and 12.30. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I give it to you to formally close the meeting. Thank you very much for all the speakers, moderators, and participants for a fruitful discussion. We can, uh, I personally take some advantage from these discussions also. I call the session close and pass this microphone, microphone to the IGF Secretariat. No, no. Oh, there is no? Okay. I have it closed this session. Thank you very much for your attention. It's not, it's not like a scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs>